This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Governor Baker's March 12th order suspended certain provisions of the open meeting law, which allows us to hold this virtual town council meeting. I will call upon each counselor by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate they can hear me and we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. This is also how we will conduct counselor comments and votes throughout the agenda. Given that we have a quorum of the council, I'm calling the meeting of June 1st to order at 632. The meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. It is also being recorded. There's no chat room. We will have a time for public comment. If there are technical issues, please let Sean or Athena know. And if at some point, if we have to, we will stop the meeting and begin trying to make sure everybody can reconnect. Having experienced that myself last two weeks ago, I understand the problem. The town has developed a two minute video helping people to connect. So I'm going to start by asking that the following people, please indicate if you are present. Shalini Balmilne. Present. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy Dumont. Present. Lynn Griesmer, present. Mid Joe Haneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shang. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. And I know that Sarah Schwartz is not able to join us this evening. Thank you. We're, I've sent, we're going to be doing the agenda in a slightly different order, but not completely. I'd like to utilize the 48 hour rule and bring to discussion first, something where we would have the town manager and the chief of police, Chief Livingstone, talk about report of this last weekend's events. So Paul, may, Paul. Sure, thank you um, to the president. Um, so we've, or, we're all aware of what happened and um, for us, for me, I'll speak for myself, this is a time for us to listen and um, pay attention to what's going on. Um, our job uh, as municipal officials is to uh, listen and amplify the voices uh, of those who aren't being heard appropriately at this point in time. Um, and to that end, we felt it was important uh, to put out a statement from the um, the um, appointed leadership of the town. And so I worked over the weekend with Chief Livingstone and Superintendent Morris to craft a statement and included the chair of the Human Rights Commission, uh, Matthew Charity, uh, and the chief engaged with the two police unions at Amherst Police Department. And we all signed on to a statement that you all have and um, tr which tries to convey um, our feelings, our horror and um, just where we are at this moment in time and what our responsibilities are. So um, I don't wanna really go into that. You've read it all. You have a lot more to say than I do. Uh, Chief, I'm not sure if there's anything you wanna to add to this. Um, not a lot, Paul, thank you. But um, you know, we've received quite frankly, a lot of comments and a lot of support from, from the community in Amherst, which was really nice to, to see and hear. I mean, we're kind of transitioning in our agency from a, you know, some older officers to a relatively young police force. Uh, we had a lot of new re 
recent hires and, and retires. So a lot of my police officers haven't really experienced this before. They certainly understand it, but they're, they had a lot of questions. I can tell you that. Um, not sure what to expect from the public and didn't know how to really respond, but you know, they're getting a quick education, but it's really about communication and um, you know, I'm a veteran officer and I've been through all the way back to the Rodney King incident through Ferguson and, and some others. And, you know, it's going to be a difficult time. There's no question about that, but, you know, we need to support our community members. We need to compute our, you know, support our citizens who are going to definitely want to, um, you know, have vigils and protest and that's their right. We will support them in that right. And, um, you know, I just, uh, appreciate Paul reaching out to me this weekend, you know, letting me participate in the statement we made. I supported it 100% and both unions supported it 100%. So, you know, it was, you know, we're, we all are really on the same page when it comes to, you know, moving forward. And, um, you know, how do we get there, I guess, is the next step in question. I've got a lot of meetings coming up with some community groups, um, and it varies from a lot of different people, but um, I'll end there and just, you know, if there are questions at some point, entertain those. But, um, you know, just thank you to Paul, so, certainly to the, the town council and to the citizens who uh, I've already spoken with. Are there any questions from councilors at this time? Okay. Then, um, in a very unusual way, we'd like to proceed with the following. We do have, Pat DeAngelis contacted me yesterday uh, and asked if she could make a statement and call for a moment of silence. And in addition to that, we've developed a uh, resolution that she will read as well as her statement. But before she gets into that, I'd like to ask for a motion to suspend Town Council Rules of Procedure Rule 8.6 for the resolution in the aftermath of the death of Mr. George Floyd. Is there a second? Second. Absolutely. All right, the motion's been made in second. We have to have a roll call vote. I will start with Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy Dumont. Darcy. You have to read her lips. She said Darcy aye. Dumont. Thank you. Aye. Reese Mears, aye. Haneke? Aye. Pam? Aye. Ross? Aye. Brian? Aye. Shane? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Steinberg? Aye. And Ball Milne? Yes. Okay. Then, Pat, why don't you proceed with your statement and we'll go forward. Thank you. Um, Today marks the eighth day since George Floyd was murdered by a police officer. The 80th day since Breonna Taylor, a young EMT, was killed in her home. The 99th day since Ahmaud Arbery was killed by white vigilantes for the crime of jogging in his neighborhood. And it marks the fifth day since Christian Cooper was targeted by a white woman who called the police claiming she was being threatened by a black man when he asked her to leash her dog. And today is an, another day added to the days since Dontre Hamilton, Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, Ezel Ford, Dante Parker, Tanisha Anderson, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Raymond Brisbane, Jeremaine Reed, Tony Robinson, Philip White, Eric Harris, Walter Schott, Freddie Gray, Atiana Jefferson, Pamela Turner, Corinne Gaines, Yvette Smith, Ayana Stanley, Philandro Castile, Sandra Bland, and Amadou Diallo were killed by police who were who in most of these cases not charged for the action of murdering unarmed African-Americans. This is not new. It has been going on for years. Today marks the 99th anniversary 
of the Tulsa Race Massacre. The massacre began over Memorial Day weekend after 19-year-old Dick Rowland, a black shoeshiner, was accused of assaulting Sarah Page, the 17-year-old elevator operator in a nearby building. He was taken into police custody. White rioters used this incident to rampage through the black neighborhoods that night and morning, killing men, burning and looting stores and homes. About 10,000 black people were left homeless and property damage amounted to more than 1.5 million in real estate and $750,000 in personal property loss, which is the equivalent to 32 uh, million dollars. The deaths of these African American men, women, and children are emblematic of the racism inherent in our country, our town, and in ourselves. They reveal the disparity between police interactions with white people and black people, and the disparity between existing as a white person and existing as a black person trying to park a car, watching birds, walking with a loved one, playing with toy guns, carrying cell phones or pill bottles that get identified as guns by police officers with fear and hate in their hearts. Police violence and white threats of violence need to stop. It is not acceptable in our country, in our town or anywhere for a white voice to be heard respected and responded to when a black or brown voice is not heard and where the person themselves is not seen. This morning, Christian Cooper's sister wrote in the New York Times, quote, we live in a country where a white person breaking rules feels confident and comfortable calling the police to threaten the black person doing nothing wrong. This has to stop, whether through more discussion to raise awareness of the issue or better enforcement of laws against false 911 reports. Lots of people keep asking me what they can do. We all have a chance to step off the sidelines, to speak up, to take action, and to shine a blinding light on the racism lurking in so many corners of our society. We need to fight together wisely boldly and unflinchingly while staying aware that our passion and actions can and will be used against us. But we must not stop. This is, this is the time. It will not be easy. It will often be messy, but it must be done." Unquote. Today marks the day when each of us must step away from the sidelines and stand with our black brother and brown sisters and brothers. The day when we must stand as a community that sees what is before its eyes, that listens to the voices of the unheard and cares for and protects all of its members. Today marks the day when the town council of Amherst, Massachusetts joins our town manager, the superintendent of our schools, our human rights commission, our chief of police, the Amherst Police Patrol Officers Union, and the Amherst Police Supervisors Union in pledging anew to do what must be done so that Amherst is a just and equitable community, a community that is truly welcome to all. And with that, um, we're going to introduce the resolution that um, Lynn and I worked on. And I'm going to ask Mandy Joe a favor. Would you read the resolution when it comes up? Is that all right? That is all right. That would be very helpful to me right now. Thank you. Sean, can you put that up? Yeah, I'm getting it up now.
Can it be bigger, Sean? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Resolution in the aftermath of the death of Mr. George Floyd. Whereas we are haunted by the searing vision of a Minneapolis police officer kneeling on a subdued man's neck as other officers witnessed Mr. George Floyd's pleas for help be ignored by the very people who are trained to help and assist. Whereas we are haunted too by the knowledge that this was not an isolated incident in our country the number of names and similar experiences is unconscionably long and an undeniable part of the history of this nation. Whereas we extend our condolences to Mr. Floyd's family and friends and to all who grieve his death, we offer our thoughts to the countless members of our community who have been personally impacted as well. Whereas we condemn the actions of the police officers involved. Whereas we feel compelled to say affirmatively and with real compassion that violence like this is yet another blow to black and brown people, particularly African American men, who are too often told by our culture that they do not matter. It confirms the lived experience of black men nationwide and yes, in our own community. This is a wrong that needs to be righted and white Americans need to join those who have been carrying this burden and do the heaviest lifting to right it. Whereas as public officials, this tragedy makes us reflect on our own practices, behavior, and attitudes. We question whether we are doing enough. Are we vigilant enough? Have we fostered a true culture of respect and honesty? We strive to remain ever thoughtful in our work as public officials to ensure that all members of our community feel part of Amherst and feel protected, listened to, and served by their public servants. Whereas as public officials, it is our duty to use our legal and moral authority to protect all members of our community, no matter their race or color or where they fall on the power spectrum. It is our duty to foster a community free of fear, intimidation, and violence, a community in which people are not targeted or hurt unnecessarily by law enforcement and provide equal protection under the law. Whereas we know we can do better as a country to confront the systemic racism that has brought us to this place of fear and distrust. We can advocate for the criminal justice system to take a firm stand against officers who use excessive force. Those of us who are white can demonstrate that protecting and promoting the rights of black and brown people in our community is integral to securing the well being of our entire community. Whereas we know many of the young people in our community have seen this video and other similar news and are trying to process these traumatizing events with their families. However, the current public health situation makes it that much more difficult as they are unable to connect with friends, extended family, or school staff in person. Whereas in the aftermath of this tragedy, we reaffirm our commitment to the larger goals of social justice and we'll focus on how we can deliver on the promise of good and fair public safety protection. We will work with our community leaders to determine the best ways for us to engage on this important mission as we continue to move forward. Now, therefore, the Amherst Town Council joins the Amherst Town Manager, Police Chief, School Superintendent, the Chair of the Human Rights Commission, and the full support of our police unions to denounce in the strongest possible terms the actions and inactions by these police officers that resulted in Mr. Floyd's death. Voted this first day of June, 2020. Thank you, Mandy. You're Thank welcome. You. I have a motion, uh, Pat. Um, I move that we accept uh, this resolution uh, and vote favorably to support it. Okay, and is there a second? Second, Shalini. Thank you, Shalini. 
Uh, I'm going to do a roll call vote and start with, is there any other discussion? I'm sorry. No, a roll call vote. I will start with Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Uh, Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pant. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Chalini Balmilne. Yes. And Alyssa Brewer. Yes. It is 12.00 with one absent. And I want to thank uh, the police and uh, the school superintendent and the town manager because we have borrowed heavily from the statement that they released last evening. Um, we would like to go to a moment of silence, but I see a hand up, Dorothy. After, after the moment of silence. Thank you. We will begin a moment of silence at this point. Thank you. Pat, thank you so much for being very active and bringing this forward. Dorothy, you had a comment. Yes, I was very um, lucky to be have been watching television when um, Floyd's brother uh, led a prayer vigil and spoke and to the people that he wanted um, to continue demonstrating, but absolutely no violence, no destruction, and said that the proper response from the people at this point, besides the things we've talked about, is voting and not just at the top, all the way down to the, the smallest local election. And I think I was very, very impressed at his uh, speech. Uh, in a moment, he was deeply emotional, but he really had his focus on, on the constructive aspects. So I just wanted that to be part of this meeting. Thank you. Shalini? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to appreciate uh, Councillor Pat DeAngelis for bringing this uh, uh, statement forward to us and also the town officials. I was very moved by the statement and the commitment of all the people in our town office. Um, and I also have a question moving forward beyond this resolution, who who is going to look into what needs to be done further? Does anything need to be done in our town? And at the town council level, who amongst us is looking into this? Which committee and what? I just feel like, you know, days will pass and this will become another event and nothing will have happened. So I just have that question. Let me just address that I, I knew, do know that the chief is planning to uh, pull together a group and we will make people aware of those meetings so that people can attend them as well. Okay. I, I just have another question. There's a person on telephone, Gazil Khaya, and uh, that, that's when you come to the public. People who are on the telephone, how can they ask questions? Or how do they raise their hands if they're on the telephone? We're going to be doing public comment in just a moment. And we will show how that's done uh, because there is a way to do that. Okay, Dorothy, is, I assume your hand has just not been taken down. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, we're going to go and show the announcement slides and I'm not going to read the announcements, uh, but Sean, would you please put them up? We have three groups of slides and I wanna just note that a couple of these on the slide are in yellow and we wanna make sure that the public notes that these are public hearings, they're forums, they are information sessions and all of this information is available on the town website. Uh, the dates and so forth are available at amherstma.gov slash calendar. And you can also get all the materials for all of these meetings. The first one beginning on June 8th at 6.30. Next slide, please. These are the upcoming committee meetings. And I wanna just uh, point out that for example, the very first one is a joint meeting of the Community Resource Committee and Finance. And then there is a joint hearing of the Community Resource Committee and the Planning Board. And this is particularly in relationship to the town manager's proposal with regard to temporary zoning, um, helping us to try to open our town. Mandy Jo, did you have a comment you wanted to make about that? Yeah, I just wanted to point out that the highlighted meeting, the June 3rd meeting is not the joint hearing on the temporary zoning that is on a different issue. Um, the joint you. hearing is the last one on the list, the June 10th meeting at 6.30. Thank you very much for that correction. It is June 10th at 6.30. And the next slide, Sean. These are just a few things that the school would like to make sure we're aware of. One is the joint meeting of the, of the three school committees around how they're going to deal with going back to school in the fall. And that will also include some public meetings as well. And then on June 5th, the Amherst Regional High School class of 2020 will have a car parade and Amherst Media will have a program beginning at 6.30. So with that, we're going to proceed on to our meeting. And the next item on the agenda is in fact public comment. So for public comment, if you are on the phone, you need to do the following. I just need to get through the instructions. Um, you need to indicate that you wish to make a comment and you press star nine on your phone and that should show up when we ask for public comment, okay? So uh, what I'd like to do now is ask for people who have public comment. And I see one caller and I need to have you identify yourself and where you live. Hi, this is Gazi Chaya Nikosi and I live in District 5. Okay, please proceed with your comment. Um, thank you so much. I'm just calling in tonight. Um, and I appreciate the resolution and um, the commitment to working with community leaders and specifically appreciate Shalini's question about how exactly we're going to make sure that the emotions that are so high right now lead to specific actions within our town. And to that end, um, a group of Community uh, members are, um, of course, in a, a, a very big time of grief right now and mourning. Um, and there's that, that grief is very heavy, but uh, they would also like to request an opportunity to be on the agenda at the next town council meeting to discuss what policies or specific actions the town council can take to ensure that um, these uh, values that were expressed in the resolution actually turn into a commitment to action. Okay. We appreciate your comment. And if you would please be in touch with me so we can figure out how we can add that to our agenda. Okay. Are there other okay. Thank you very much. Certainly. Thank you for calling. Are there other public comments at this time? Okay. I don't see any. Darcy, you have your hand up, however. Yeah, I just um, uh, wanted to mention the in the list of meetings that we 
that you had upcoming meetings that the town services and outreach next meeting is on uh, June 15th at 9.30 a.m. That didn't make it on the list. Okay. Remember the list is public and it's on all the calendar of the web town website. Okay. Uh, we're going to proceed on then with our um, presentations. I'm sorry, no. Our next thing is I just want to mention because these are on the consent agenda. We have two other consent agenda items, our resolutions tonight. One is the LGBTQ and uh, uh, Pat DeAngelis and um, Evan Ross are the sponsors of that. Would like you like to say anything about that at this time? Okay, we're gonna move on then. And the other one is Race Amity Day and Alyssa Brewer is the sponsor. Alyssa, anything that you would like to say at this time? This is something town meeting did several years ago and the, so the select board has been doing it annually since to show everyone that it really is an annual event because much as the previous caller referenced is, you know, what's our follow through? And our follow through on this has typically been trying to participate in the event. Of course, it's going to be a Zoom event this year, so it'll be different. And Lynn's already reached out to us about how we might divide up reading the proclamation. So thank you. Okay. And Evan, you do have your, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I wanted, I guess, just say briefly, um, the, the Pride Month proclamation uh, that's before us is almost identical to last year, uh, and yet it feels very different this year, um, passing it. I think that uh, given the discussion that we just had in this council, um, often Pride is seen as a time to celebrate, um, and it doesn't necessarily feel like we're in a celebratory atmosphere right now. Um, but I think it's still something that's important. And I think what if I could have written, rewritten the proclamation now, um, as opposed to reusing the one uh, that we reused, I probably would have strived to acknowledge in it um, that what this proclamation is celebrating, the rights, the freedoms um, that have been secured that we need to maintain, um, where those came from, um, all came from um, black and brown LGBT Americans who fought for them. Um, and I think in this moment right now, it's worth recognizing that. Last year, we raised the pride flag for the first time to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, uh, which we celebrate as the start of the gay rights movement, uh, but don't often talk about the fact that it was a riot against police brutality and against police targeting a marginalized group. Um, and it was a riot that was led by uh, queer, brown and black folk. Um, and so that's not something that's in this proclamation, um, but it's something that I think I want to make sure we acknowledge given the moment we're in right now and that would have been in there otherwise. Lynn, you're muted. Thank you so much. I try to mute in between. Uh, we're going to go on to our presentations. The first one is the one month budget and I'm going to call on Paul Bachelman and um, Sean. That's Sean Thank McConnell. You. Yeah, Sean, you're here. Um, and I with am. the picture. Okay, good. Glad to see your picture. Um, so uh, some previously the town council had authorized the manager to present to you a one month budget in anticipation of a fuller budget process as you delayed the presentation of the budget. So what Sean and Sonia have developed and uh, I'm basically forwarding to you tonight is a one month budget or that we call one month budget. It's slightly larger uh, than it might otherwise be and Sean can walk through that. Um, this um, the way the finance committee look, the finance team looked at this is they looked at the historical level of spending over the past four or five years I think, uh, and then talked with all the department heads and sort of identified the level of support they needed to get through July. So Sean, do you want to add anything to what do you want to add to that? There is much to be added. Yeah, I mean it's a relatively brief presentation tonight. Um, I have a couple slides. Should I share my screen? Um, actually, I believe you sent those to us, so we're okay, going to. Yeah. 
put them up. Perfect. All right. So uh, first, just a quick reminder why we are looking at a one month budget. Um, we wanted to extend the, the timeline for the budget process to allow us to gather some more information on some of our revenues and some of our expenditures. Um, some of the things we are keeping a close eye on that will affect our budget is the status of the colleges and the university, um, the status of our, our K through 12 schools, the library and other town services, whether they open in the fall, um, either under a normal uh, approach or if they have some sort of modified approach that they have to open up under. Um, we're monitoring the state budget, which still isn't finalized. We're uh, waiting for a word. We, we've received some word on state and federal government aid programs, but um, there's still more to come and, and some of those programs are changing. And we're also, we wanted more time to gauge the impact on our local receipts. We knew a month ago that things were not gonna look good, but now we have much more information on um, what the impact of the stay at home orders were on things like parking and permits and things of that nature. So that's why we decided to go with a one month budget is to give a little bit more time to, to gather information on these types of things. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So the one month budget is here on the left. Um, it's broken down to different categories, um, town operating budget, elementary schools, region assessment, library services, retirement assessment, regional lockup, and the different enterprise funds. And the total of the one month budget is $11,570,046. So it is a little bit greater than one twelfth of a typical operating budget. And that's because there are some, um, some expenditures that are in there that are things that are paid in July. Um, primarily the Hampshire County Retirement System, we pay the full amount in July. And by doing so, we typically get a discount um, that's in the range of $20,000 a year. Um, some other things to note about the one month budget, it will give us the authority to spend money during the month of July without a full budget in place. Uh, we determine these amount, amounts, as Paul said, by looking at historical spending over the last few years and talking with uh, each department to see if, it, if the amount that we put forward made sense for what they expected for the month. Um, as I mentioned, the, the large one-time expenditures have been considered. Um, it is not intended to replace the, the full FY21 budget. Um, it's a, as you can see, it's a very simple table with some amounts and some, some backup that we have to support those amounts. Um, but we still plan on doing a full FY21 budget document that will really be the, the policy document for the, for the town. Um, it doesn't include any budget additions or reductions. Those will come with the full FY21 budget. And ultimately, the way we, we hope to approach this is that, is that this one month budget will be replaced by the full 12 month budget when that's approved by town council. Um, so we'll get this in place so we have the authorization to spend. And then when the full budget is approved, we'll rescind this and the full budget will go back. Um, to July 1. So you'll still get the full 12 month budget to review um, under the modified timeline. And this will be discussed in a little bit more depth tomorrow at Finance Committee. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, Kathy Shane. Uh, thank you um, for what I think is a very clear set of two tables. So my question is what's about what's not on the table. Um, as, as you well know, because you're staffed to it, we've just gone through a, what's capital spending going to look like starting the next fiscal year. Um, you don't have any specifics for capital, which I think makes sense. But my question then is, if roads and sidewalks and some other capital needs need to happen in July. Do we have enough money left in um, unspent funds from money that was already appropriated for the current year to go ahead and uh, be doing some of that work in July? So not just roads and sidewalks, but if there was a repair or something. So are, are we saying that on the capital side, we, we have some spending that can go on in July. We don't have to wait to do a one month budget for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, Paul and Sonia can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that we're still planning to do the, the capital budget by July 1, mm -hmm. so that that budget will be in effect for July 1. I thought that's how we, the last timeline we looked at it, that the vote for capital was going to take place at the end of, of uh, June. Okay, so we would have a full year capital budget at that point, so therefore yeah, we don't our, need to think it, Okay. That, it'll okay, be under, yeah, it'll be under our modified, you know, the, the approach that we'll talk about more, you know, with Joint Capital Planning Committee and their recommendation. Um, but 
unless I'm misremembering, I think we set that up so the timeline had the vote for capital happening before July. Okay, okay. I, we did. Can I jump in for that? Paul, if you have another comment. Yeah, so so at tomorrow's finance committee meeting, this the the schedule for the next um, two months is laid out. That's where the finance committee will review that schedule. And once the finance committee says that's a, that's a go, we will share that with all committee members and put it on our website as well. That does include reviewing the capital requests um, on a truncated basis based on the JCPC report and delivering that to the council on June fifteenth, I think, or something like that. And then you'll be able to vote it with a recognition that we will come back in the fall to do a more thorough review of all the capital requests that are before us. Okay. Andy Steinberg, you, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I, wanna, I was gonna um, partly uh, respond along the same lines that Paul just responded to. Uh, June 15th, on the, at the beginning of the meeting when we showed schedule of events to happen, there are two important things that have to do with capital um, that are on June 15th. One is the presentation um, of the capital improvement program, but the other is uh, the council is required by the charter to hold um, a public forum annually about the capital improvement program. and. Uh, as you recall from prior experience of public forum is the um, time when we have to have at least 50% of the time devoted to um, hearing from members of our public. And that is um, scheduled also for uh, the same day on uh, June 15th. So those are two very important days. And as uh, Paul indicated, um, if the uh, Finance Committee agrees with the proposed schedule for the process, then the Council at the June 29th meeting would take up both the one month budget and the capital improvement program. The other thing that was on that um, list of events at the beginning is, are two things that were very important. One is relating to what we're talking about right now, and that is the Finance Committee is required to hold public hearings on all segments of the budget. And uh, that includes uh, the one month budget the, um, and the regional school budget, which were both in the packet for tonight's meeting. Um, and both of those have been scheduled for June 8th and uh, they will um, take place uh, early in the evening of June 8th before the full um, council meeting, so it's a joint meeting of the council and the finance committee for the purpose of satisfying that and giving us more opportunities as counselors as well as members of the public to ask questions about the one month uh, budget. So thank you. Are there any other questions or comments on the one month budget at this time? We will do the referral of the one month budget as part of the consent agenda. So it will not come back up. All right, then I want to move on to the next item, uh, which we, I don't want to get into a lengthy discussion tonight. I'd like to use this as an opportunity to introduce this. Um, it has really been come to my attention and to several people's attention that as a council, we have not consistently dealt with requests for permanent change to the public way. And so I put together a memo with the assistance of Mandy Johanneke, uh, Paul Bachelman, and Dave Zomack that outlines two potential possibilities. Sean, would you please put the memo up? That's coming up now. Thank you. While he's doing that, let me just start by saying, at this point, we do not have an automatic referral of 
requests for long-term use of the public way um, to any committee. If we did, it would be to TSO. So one of the options that you'll see on the memo is that we either create through our rules of procedure an automatic referral, or we continue to use the option that we have been using, which is we vote to refer from the council. The second option on this is to basically say, well, the council will deal with it, and then it might or might not go to TSO. The thing we're trying to avoid, and we have a couple of people tonight who are uh, directly in, um, in relationship to that attending this meeting, and that is, is causing people who are petitioners to have to come back to multiple meetings. And so, no, that's not it, Sean. Okay. Um, so with that, I just wanted to say that we're going to introduce that this evening. If there's any quick comments at this point, maybe Mandy Joe, you'd like to add an explanation to it. But the reality is I don't want to make take the time from the rest of our agenda tonight uh, in, and give you more opportunity to look at it since you did not receive it until this morning. Mandy Joe, any other comments? No, I don't think so. Okay. So unless there's a, a burning question, uh, I'd like to go on. Darcy? Um, uh, I, am I on mute? No, you're, we can hear you. Uh, I guess I was just um, interested to, um, I'd like to be involved in that committee as chair of the committee that would be receiving the public way requests. Um, seems like it would make sense to, for me to be involved in that committee. It would be TSO. So right. you are involved. But I'm talking about involved in the committee that is working on the proposal. Okay. The, this proposal, or this is not a proposal, it is a memo. And depending on the council's discussion of it, it would then be referred to TSO for, and to GOL for recommendation back to the council on how they would like to proceed. So that we would expect both TSO and GOL who would look at and weigh in on a process. And how did, how did the council deal with these um, uh, issues when they went to the CRC? It was as inconsistent as it is now. And tonight we have two examples of the inconsistency. Uh, one of our uh, public way requests that we're going to hear tonight is Southeast Street. So Southeast Street is um, came to the council, referred to TSO, and then came is coming back to the council tonight with a recommendation from TSO. On the other hand, last two weeks ago, we introduced the University Drive, and we required that it had to be discussed and we weren't prepared that night to discuss it at the full level because we assumed it might be a referral, but instead people felt like they were ready to act and they asked for us to have the full presentation at the town council instead of referral to TSO. So it puts us in a situation of not knowing which way these very important and significant long-term requests are going to go. And so sometimes we're at a council meeting like we were two weeks ago, and we don't have everybody there because we weren't expecting that. So what we would like to do with this memo is have a referral to TSO to discuss what process they think would be best, and then also to GOL if there's going to be a rule change. So it's not a separate committee that would be looking at this. It's the existing committees of the council. Okay, Darcy? Yeah, I guess I feel like this is a, a policy of the whole council and it would be good to have a discussion among the whole council about it. Okay. Um, okay. Kathy, you have your hand up. Uh, that was gonna be my comment and I just, I, I, I agree with the thrust and the purpose of this, of getting some clarity on 
how we're handling. And, and my memory of the, the short year and a half we've been together, <laughs> which feels like a lot more, is that GOL at one point had the public way and uh, did some things with parking meters in very short term to get some things off our, our list. So, so I do think going through it systematically, and I just, I guess my question, Lynn, and I don't need an answer now, I think it needs a deliberative process. It's not a quick. Um, it's trying to trying to really think through different options. And you described a, a small group that certainly had the right kinds of people in it, but getting some input on how do other towns deal with these issues? How can we do it in a way that we're sure we have had enough discussion, but not keep people bouncing back and forth? So the sentiment is there. Okay, Dorothy. You have your hand up. You have to need, Darth, you need to unmute. Right. Yep. I'm looking at this uh, memo and the third bullet down, I'm finding the type size just a little too small, but when I try to read a complicated paragraph like the third bullet down with the magnifying glass, you can't really do that. You can't really grasp the, the, the comments. Um, I think that we have a very great inconsistency in how we've been talking about the use of the public way and that we need to really put together a, a better, a system that is clear, consistent and fair um, in our responses. And I, if you're going to, I don't know what that third bullet paragraph is saying, because it's, you know, it's hard to get a document that is just that's complicated that has got legal things in it and that is in very small print. could you explain that third bullet yes Please. yeah the third bullet basically addresses the possibility of if there needs to be a hearing and where would that hearing be held and right now we have not authorized tso to hold hearings but one possibility just as we have authorized CRC to do hearings and uh, the charter authorized finance to do hearings would be the possibility that TSO could do hearings as well. Yeah, hearings don't have to occur all the time, but they do have to occur when it's issues like parking or abutters. And so it's basically just laying out that possibility. I apologize for the small type. Right. But, you know, when you the, the question is, if you're having the people um, who want the to use the public right of way to the TSO committee meeting so that we could have a good discussion, the town council would also feel that they would want to be here's those facts, at least in some form. So I noticed that that uh, CRC hearings are often done as part of a um, joint town council meeting, and it's getting kind of confusing at this moment. Um, I just feel like somehow things are getting more complicated and not not simpler. But that may just be my point of view. Okay. Alyssa, you have your hand up. I know you didn't want to talk about this at length. So I think telling us that we'll talk about it at length another time is terrific, but I appreciate you pulling it together because it has been super confusing as we've all talked about. The only thing I wanted to clarify that was a little different is that when we talk about required hearings, we're required to have hearings if we intend to change something. One of the things you've heard me argue at various town council meetings is maybe we don't want to change something. If a petitioner brings us something that in fact is not something that's been done under the petition process under the charter, we can say that's interesting, but no thank you. We have too many other things on our plate and we don't ever have to hold the hearing at TSO, at town council, anywhere. If we wanna make changes, however, there are things we have to have hearings about as we'll hear about again later tonight. So that's part of the issue here too, is how much of it, as Lynn has very carefully pointed out, is like efficiency of going ahead and just referring it right away. And maybe that's efficient, but maybe it's not because if people have to talk about it multiple times or have joint meetings, the other part is who's deciding when it ends up on what agenda. And that does tend to, you know, that plays out a different way, right? If we talk about it first at town council and then decide to refer it versus the other. So I appreciate her drawing these things up and I assume we'll just bring our feedback to whatever meeting she tells us to bring it to. Correct. If there's any other comment at this point, 
fine, but otherwise uh, we've introduced the subject and we'll bring it back at another time. Okay, seeing none, then we're going to move to the consent agenda. So I, Sean, I wanna make sure you put the consent agenda up and that you make sure it can be read. It's multiple slides, so just tell me when okay. to advance. I'll start. So let me just remind people, the consent agenda is, is the following. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine, and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when the president lists the consent agenda items. If you'll wait till I get all the way through them, that would be good. The request to remove an item from the consent agenda does not require a second. So the, the motion is as follows. To move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve these items as a single unit. The first one is to suspend town council rules of procedure, rule 8.6, for the following agenda item, Race Amity Day Proclamation. And that's because we did not have this in time for it to go to GOL. And so therefore we are asking exception to that rule. The second is to, to spend Town Council Rules of Procedure Rule 8.4 for the following agenda items. The permanent change of public way 133 and 143 Southeast Street and 7D, Town Council Policy Regarding the Control and Regulation of Public Ways, Section 3B. All, of, all this does is allow mm. us to deal with these issues tonight. It does not, we, they will still be on the agenda, they will still be discussed, and it does not mean that you've accepted them, it just means that we can deal with them tonight if we feel we are ready to. 5A is the adoption of the LGBTQ Pride Month Proclamation, and 5B is the adoption of the Race Am Amity Day Proclamation. 7C is referral of the amendment to Zoning Bylaw 11.250 regarding the votes required for the Planning Board decision, the Community Resources Committee, and Planning Board. This is a straightforward referral to the bodies that are most affected by this, it does deal very quickly. Um, hold on, I'm sorry. It does deal with the uh, issue with regard to um, site plan review and the number of votes and is basically related to the issue of the fact that the charter reduced the number of people on the planning board, but this bylaw did not get changed. Um, the next one is the referral of the one month budget to the finance committee. We've already had a presentation on that. The 7F is the referral of the regional school budget to the finance committee. We will, um, th that also is uh, pretty straightforward. The next one is the referral of Community Preservation Act community recommendations, committee recommendations to the Community Resource Committee and Finance Committee of the Town Council um, agenda, June 1st, 2020. Both of those items are on the agenda, but this refers them without further discussion. Approval of amendment to Town Council Rules of Procedure, Rule 4.2, proposed rule 4.6 regarding the use of consent agenda. And that is something the council has discussed at at least one previous council meeting, if not two. Please go forward. And then the last item on the consent agenda is the approval of the minutes. And we have four sets of minutes starting with April 21st, May 1st, May 4th, May 11th, and May 18th. I see one hand up at this time, Darcy. Yes, um, I'd like to remove 7A2 and 
seven A seven A two and seven A nine. Okay, are there any other questions, any other requests at this time? I'm sorry, I'm not sure which ones, Darcy, you're referring to. Yeah, would you tell uh, exactly which ones you're referring to? Could you go to the previous slide? It's up there. Oh, okay. Um, 7A2 are, is, exactly what it says there there are two items suspend town council rules for 8.4 for the those two items um and nine is approval of amendment to town council rules procedure rule 4.2 okay. regarding consent agenda okay kathy you have your hand up yeah i which is the one that changes the number of votes on the planning committee? And is that, would this be for uh, site visits and everything, uh, the number of votes required? It's site plan review and it's numbers, items five here. It's a 7C on your agenda. Okay, 7C. I'd like to move that and have a quick discussion of that also. Okay. Great. Are there any other discussion at this time? All right, so then the consent agenda is as follows. To move the following items and printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. Suspend town council rules of procedure, rule 8.6 for the following agenda item, 5B race Amity Day proclamation. Adoption of the LGBTQ Pride Month Proclamation, Adoption of Race Amity Day Proclamation, Referral of One Month Budget to Finance Committee, Referral of Regional School Budget to Finance Committee, Referral of Community Preservation Act Committee Recommendations to the Community Resources Committee and the Finance Committee, and approval of the minutes for April 2nd, I'm sorry, April 21st, uh, there are two sets of minutes, May 1st, May 4th, May 11th, and May 18th. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. Did you get that, Athena? Okay. Yes, thank you. Then we are going to move to a roll call vote. I'm starting with Darcy Dumont. Yes. Greasemers, yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Shriver. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Shalini Balmoon. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. And Pat DeAngelis. Yes. The vote is 12 0, 0 with one absent. Okay, so then we are going to move on to the permanent changes to the public way. Um, if we, um, we need to move to this and our first item, if you'll take that down, please. This is a report that's coming from the um, TSO. And um, because we did not suspend town council rule of procedure 8.4 for the current agenda item, we need to have that motion at this time. So in the event that we go ahead and do this, I'm going to move to suspend town council rule of procedure 8.4 for the current agenda item. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, just, <laughs> just trying to figure out what we're doing here. Um, could you explain again what the motion was? All this motion does is allow us to act tonight and that we would be acting on an item that has been before the council. This is the second time and it's been before TSO in between. 
so we, we would be acting on TSO's recommendation. All right, I guess um, I would just say that um, this is technically our first reading of it in the council, is it not? No, it was presented to the council uh, either four or six weeks ago. Then it was referred to TSO. Mandy Jo? Um, it is technically the first reading because we didn't consider that referral the first reading, which is why we have to suspend the rules tonight in order to actually vote tonight. Thank you for that correction. Okay. Okay, so I'm, uh, I guess my argument would be that, that I feel like if, uh, if for substantive issues such as public way requests that um, are otherwise required to have two readings, that um, it's fine if members of the council are, feel that they're ready to go, um, even if the, uh, the committee in question voted unanimously for it, which is what happened in the Southeast Street public way application. I feel that at least part of the reason for having two readings is to allow the public to have adequate time to weigh in. Um, and so I guess I feel pretty strongly that with, with a proposal like this, there's, there's really no reason to rush it through. Um, there's, it would only be an additional two weeks. It would come back. Um, the, the, the public would have an opportunity to weigh in if they had any, anything to say about it at all. And um, I think that's an important consideration. Motion's been made and seconded. Are there other comments? This is the motion to suspend Town Council Rule Procedure 8.4. And we're going to call the question on it and move to that. Um, um, it's a roll call vote. And we start in this case with Lynn Griesmer and I vote to support the motion. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Dorothy? I'm trying to unmute. Abstain for now. Uh, Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. Kathy Shane? Abstain. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Chalini Balmoon? Yes. Alyssa Brewer? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. And Darcy Dumont? No. Okay, so it is nine four, one against two abstentions and one absent. Did I get that right, Athena? Yes. Thank you. So the motion passes. So now we're going to move on to actually hearing the report from the um, committee, that's TSO, uh, who discussed this and uh, Darcy, I'm calling on you for the report or any other committee member you designate. Uh, Evan, would you like to report on that? I defer to you as chair. Fine. Um, so we, uh, we discussed this at our, at our next to the last meeting and uh, you received the report at our last town council meeting. Um, Evan led the discussion and um, uh, it was fairly brief. Um, we didn't hear directly from the owner developer, but we did um, hear from, from um, Chris Brestrup. And um, uh, we voted unanimously to approve the application. There was a, some some degree of discussion. We brought up the issue of the um, recommendations that were made by the, the um, design review board. 
uh, with regard to the amenities for the public way request. And we ultimately ended up um, voting not to include them because we thought that they would stand by themselves as a recommendation from the design review board. Um, this group might decide to do something different about that. Um, so uh, the recommendations of the design review board were the addition of recycling, a recycling receptacle, a bench with arms, a bench without arms, and um, light fixtures, uh, which they thought would um, enhance the public way. So um, unless any of the other members have anything to add, that was basically um, what we did. We recommended um, approval. Uh, Darcy, Pam, you have your hand up. Hmm. Right. Um, let's just say that I've been doing further thought on a topic I've done a lot of thought on. And that is that I don't know what our policy is on the public way. Um, except that the word public is in there and um, it seems to be not really not really thinking of the public that much and a lot of a lot of the time the public way is being given away to private interests and what got me really going was going through the papers and seeing the latest drawing very clear colorful drawing where there's one sidewalk right up to the edge of the building and the other one is up to the edge of the street and i thought gee now which one would i walk on the answer is I wouldn't want to walk on either one of the two sidewalks. I'd be, who wants to walk right up next to the edge of a, of a very, you know, a simple plain building? And who wants to walk next to the street? And yes, there are amenities that have been put in the middle between them, but it's not a really good public way. And I, and I think, I mean, right now we're getting ready to open, uh, use a public way to help the businesses downtown open. And I'm saying, thank goodness, that in some of the blocks downtown, there are wide sidewalks so that you have actually the ability to do, to do that. There are other places where their sidewalks are not wide enough for anything. So I just feel we don't really have a firm understanding of how we deal with the public way and protecting it. Um, and it's each situation is different. Um, and I have different feelings about other spots, but this is one where the building is right up to the edge of the public way. And then the sidewalk, narrow sidewalk is put there. And then there's some green grass and then the other sidewalks next to the street. And I'm, you know, it looks kind of interesting, but then when you think about using it, being a person on it, and I don't see it as being a good use, even though it went through many, many meetings and many, many boards. So um, I feel that we have to have a clearer understanding of, of that. Maybe talking with lawyers and I don't know, maybe checking other towns. I think that Darcy's right, that we have to see what do other people do? What have they been doing? Because right now we're being very inconsistent. We have no, I have no sense of what we should be doing. Alyssa? Well, I'm gonna have to say that one of the reasons we feel like we don't know what we're doing is because we don't have a consistent process for how to address it. But then beyond that, it also doesn't come up terribly frequently. And so it, feels like a series of one-offs. It's in fact not accurate to say that in the town of Amherst, a lot of the time the public way has been given away. That's, that's not factually true in Amherst. It might very well be true in other communities. It's not true here. I understand the concern of not wanting it to happen here, but it hasn't happened here and it won't happen here. And in fact, in many cases, sidewalks exist that didn't exist before. There were just dirt paths and now there are sidewalks. They may not be the sidewalks on the back and the set that you would like, but they are sidewalks. So I think the difference here is, is, is trying to figure out, and we struggled with this at TSO, is how much of it is our personal preference as to how we really think the urban landscape should look and how much of it is given the zoning bylaw we have, mm -hmm. given the requirements around that, what do we need to potentially change? And we do that mm -hmm. through zoning. And that is a way of, of looking at design very carefully. But I don't, I think one of the struggles we had at TSO is that we couldn't take our preferences for that future design and apply it to something that was under done under existing design. So I think it does put some additional pressure on figuring out 
what we what the master plan said what we think the master plan means now and what that means to the town council because then it will be clearer how those two things fit together but at this time we aren't getting to decide that that's done through planning and the zba in some cases and so it's the underlying zoning bylaw and the underlying lack of uh, various design guidelines that's the underlying problem not the process of the town council having to talk about the public way and part of the reason that we haven't had this very often over the last several years is because there's been very little new development over the past several years and so when you have the new things happen then it suddenly brings all this to the fore in a way that we didn't necessarily have to deal with for several years in a row okay. evan yeah i just wanted to make sure um for the public and the press that could be covering this conversation to push back on, on two statements. One is the idea that we're giving away the public way. We're not giving anything away. We're maintaining ownership of the public way. It will still be the public way. We are allowing a developer to improve the public way to add amenities at their expense. That's the proper way to frame this. We are not giving anything away. And in fact, we are receiving great benefits. I'm not sure um, if Councillor Pam has walked on that section of Southeast Street. There is no sidewalk right now. Um, it's not a great place to walk or bike. Um, it will be after this. And so I, I would hate for us to say we are giving it away. We are maintaining ownership and we are uh, accepting improvements to it on someone else's dime. And the other thing that, that was stated was that the sidewalks that were being put in would be narrow sidewalks. One of the things that came up in the conversation at TSO with um, Chris Brushup was the sidewalks and their width. And she reported that they would be six foot sidewalks each. So they would be wider than the sidewalks that are in front of my house and the sidewalks that are in front of Councillor Pam's house. So these are not narrow sidewalks. These are actually pretty big sidewalks on both sides. George Ryan. I'd just like to point out to my colleagues that uh, TSO voted unanimously to approve this permanent change to the public way. And I hope that we will move now to do that as a body. Okay. Uh, is there, are there any other comments? Then I'm going to ask uh, either Darcy or Evan to read the motion. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I would like Evan to read it. I'm actually going to make a, a motion, a very small motion to amend this. So I'm going to ask Evan to read this. Evan, do you have the motions handy? I am I am pulling it up right now. Why not okay. just make the motion? Why not let Darcy make the motion she wants to begin with? Oh, I could do that. Um, <laughs> good idea, Alyssa. <laughs> um, all right, I can read it. Um, move to approve permanent improvements to the public way from the curb line to the property line in front of 133 and 143 Southeast Street, as detailed on the document titled Southeast Common CD Set 2020 PDF, to be made by the applicant as indicated in SPR 201907, and to be maintained by said applicant or future owner for the life of the building from the curb line to the property line, including repair and replacement of paving and site furnishings as needed, including those recommended by the design review board, period. A maintenance plan for this area shall be submitted to the planning department and the Department of Public Works and shall be drafted in accordance with an email from Jason Skeels, town engineer, to Christine Brustrup, planning director, dated October 16th, 2019, the area shall be maintained in accordance with the maintenance plan. Is there a second? Alyssa, you have your hand up. No, okay. We need to, uh, Dana, please take people's hands down. Is there a second to the motion? I will second it. 
Yeah. Uh, that was Mandy Joe. Mandy yes. Joe. Okay, yes. I just didn't know for sure. Uh, people would like to speak to the motion. Melissa. As both George and Darcy pointed out, we voted 5-0 on the motion that was originally on the motion sheet. We did not, we specifically did not include that language Darcy just added. That was voted down. The sense of the group was that that was not necessary to do. I understand that she gave the idea of that during her report, but that's not what the group decided to do. If you would like us to rehash the entire conversation we had there about that, I think we can do that, but I don't think we should just do it based on, let's just add it in. Evan? I, I agree with what Alyssa said, so I was going to offer an amendment to the motion to strike the language, including those recommended by the Design Review Board from the motion. Okay, is there a second to the amendment? I will second that, Mandy. Okay, so the second to the motion that is now on the floor is include to, to strike the words including those recommended by the Design Review Board. Is there any further comment? I would just um, uh, suggest that it is actually important for us to respect the work that's been done by the committees, by the Planning Board, by the Design Review Board, and so on. And I understand that the, the group didn't end up voting for that. I regret my vote on that. Um, uh, in retrospect, I think that it just is really important. It's very, the, the suggestions that they made are very modest and, um, and obviously would enhance the, the public way and uh, would be um, helpful to the public. I mean, and that I believe is our job to try to help make these public way requests um, to focus on the actual public way and making sure that the developer is providing what the public needs in that spot. So that's exactly what the design review board did. And uh, like I said, I, I, I get that we voted unanimously for it, but I think that at least, uh, at least one of us uh, would change votes now. Evan, you have your hand up. Yeah, so just to provide a little bit of context in the TSO discussion about where we came down on the design review board recommendations. Um, there was agreement in the committee, um, <clears throat> excuse me, at least at that time, that we wanted the developer to have those recommendations, but we didn't want to make those compulsory. We didn't want to um, make it a requirement for the developer to get the public way. So uh, just because we don't require it doesn't mean the developer might not take those recommendations on but we didn't want to say we're not giving you the public way unless you do this number of benches with arms and this number of benches without arms which as a reminder is what was in the design review board recommendation this many benches with arms this many benches without and we thought that it was really important that the developer had the recommendation but that we didn't want to say we're not going to let you use the public way unless you do these things and so that's where tso kind of came um, to a decision was important for them to have the recommendation to know, but we'll leave it to the discretion of the developer whether they wanted to implement them. We weren't going to make our approval contingent on that. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Yes, I do. Um, I understand Evan's arguments. Um, however, when we discussed it, uh, one of the uh, objections to the recommendations was the recycling container. And the question was, would that become a trash nuisance? Which is why um, Darcy has the maintenance plan um, accompanying the, with the design review board recommendations so that that objection would be answered. Uh, I do agree with Evan that um, recommendations are good. Uh, however, um, this builder will do things that he is required to do, at least in terms of why there's no affordable housing, and there is none. And when I asked why he has um, handicapped accessible, he said because it was required, which is the importance of requiring things if you really want them. So um, I support Darcy's motion. All right, there's been a motion made and seconded 
then we had an amendment to remove the words, including those recommendations recommended by the design review board. And that was seconded. I'm going to call the question on the amendment. Go ahead. Okay. The amendment withdraws. The amendment. I'm sorry. Okay. The amendment withdraws the words, those recommended by the design review board. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. I find this complicated. Mandy Joe, do I need to do the two thirds call the question? Okay. No one's got their hand raised, so I think you're okay. Okay, then let's go. Uh, this the motion is to withdraw the original from the original motion, including the recommended those recommended by the design review board. The roll call vote, and we will start with. Uh, Griesmer, I am in support of the motion to amend. Haneke? Yes, on, on the motion to strike. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Uh, no. Uh, uh, Evan Ross? Yes. Brian? Yes. Shane? Yes. Driver? Yes. Steinberg? Yes. Paul Milne? Yes. Brewer? Yes. DeAngelis? Yes. Dumont? No. Okay, the motion on the, uh, the vote on the amendment is 10 for, two against, no abstentions, one absent. And we're back to the original motion. Uh, is there any further discussion? So the way the motion now reads, it reads as follows. To approve permanent improvements in the, to the public way from the curb line to the property line in front of 133 and 143 Southeast Street, as detailed on the document titled SE Commons CD set to 2020.0305 PDF to be made by the applicant as indicated in SPR 2019-07 and to be maintained by said applicant or future owners for the life of the building from the curb line to the property lining line, including repair and replacement of pavement, paving and site furnishings as needed. A maintenance plan for this area shall be submitted to the planning department and the Department of Public Works and shall be drafted in accordance with the email from Jason Scales, town engineer to Christine Brestrup, planning director, dated October 16th, 2019. The area shall meet, be meet, maintained in accordance with the maintenance plan. That is the motion. I'm going to move immediately to the roll call. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ross? Yes. Brian? Yes. Shane? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Paul Milne. Yes. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. Yes. And Grease Mercy. Yes. So the motion is passed at 12 0 0 and one absent. 12 4, none against, none abstained, one absent. We're moving on to one university drive. And I'd like to call upon Dave Somak. And we need the map for University Drive shown. Is Dave? Yeah, there you are, David. I am here. Great. Great. Thank you very much, Lynn. Okay. Um, thank you for having me tonight. I'll try to be brief. Um, I'm joined tonight um, by the applicant uh, who is represented by attorney uh, Tom Reedy. Um, I know that uh, Jason Skeels, our town engineer, is also available tonight if uh, the council has questions. And I'm gonna try to be very brief and let Tom uh, tell you more about the proposal. I know you discussed this public way request uh, briefly at your last meeting, but in consultation with Paul, I wanted to share a few introductory remarks um, about the proposal from a staff perspective. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to attorney Reedy. 
So very quickly, um, the permitting, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. The permitting process, um, there's been a very thorough and rigorous uh, public uh, process uh, to get us to this point. Um, the Conservation Commission reviewed the proposal, uh, the proposed project and issued an order of conditions allowing the project to proceed. Um, there are significant wetlands, as you can see from the site plan, uh, but all of uh, the plan was approved by the commission some months ago. The planning board reviewed the project and recommended approval to the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals reviewed the project and granted a special permit uh, back on March 12th. Um, it includes a mixed use building with 45 um, apartment units uh, and key uh, to this uh, development is five affordable units. There'll be 3,700 square feet of office space for a doctor's office and an additional uh, just over a thousand square feet that can be rented to another tenant. Um, I'm gonna save talking a little bit about the parking and some of the public way improvements to attorney Reedy, if that's okay. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the advantages to the town. Um, so throughout the process, I, I talked about the public process briefly and how thorough and rigorous it was, but throughout the process, um, town staff have worked very closely with the applicant uh, and in response to concerns uh, expressed and, and uh, uh, improvements, uh, suggested improvements uh, expressed by committees and boards, town staff have worked uh, diligently to improve the project. Um, we've had input from the two chiefs, from Guilford Mooring, our superintendent of public works, from Christine, Christine Brestrup, our planning director, Rob Mora was very involved in, in these discussions. And finally, um, uh, credit to Jason Skeels for helping the applicant to um, make some uh, significant improvements, we believe, to the public way and to traffic flow and safety and parking. Uh, and I'll let attorney Reedy talk more about that. Um, but other, so advantages of the, of the project. First and foremost, uh, it, it will provide housing. And we know from the housing production plan done back in 2013, uh, the town of Amherst needs housing, new housing, more housing in all categories. And as I said before, key to this would be at least five affordable units. The property um, uh, and the project as envisioned will also um, provide substantially increased tax revenue uh, for the town over the existing single family home, which is on the property now. Um, I think I'll end there and turn it over to Mr. Reedy, but in, but in closing, I guess what I wanted to say was that there's been a very thorough process. Uh, town staff have been uh, um, right there all along the way, uh, giving feedback, trying to make the project um, better as it went. Um, and I think it's a great example of how we can work with the development community. We can work with our boards and committees um, to, to put forth a project that is in the right location, the right size, working on working around um, environmental uh, concerns, in this case, wetlands, uh, sensitive wetlands, and come up with a project that is better and uh, a win-win for the town. So let me stop there. And um, Mr. Reedy, I think, can tell you more about the specifics of the project and talk um, about the proposal that his client would like to put forth uh, for the public way improvements. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Dave. Good evening, Madam President, Councilors. I'm Tom Reedy. I'm an attorney with Bacon Wilson in Amherst uh, here on behalf of You Drive South, um, Barry Roberts, Kurt Shumway. And I think Dave hit the nail on the head. Uh, this project um, started in late 2018 when we first approached the town to talk about you know, the planning department, the building department, to talk about this site uh, and the potential improvements. And I can say that this parking and the, um, the public way improvements were not part of any of those initial discussions. And in fact, they probably weren't part of the discussions until late 2019 um, when I think it was Mr. Skeels had suggested uh, the creation of a roundabout. And so you'll, if you're familiar with this area, which I'm sure all of you are, University Drive South is uh, a 100 foot wide right of way, which is relatively unique as, as right of ways come. I believe it to be um, somewhat vestigial. Uh, University Drive is also 100 feet wide on the other side of Northampton Road. 
Um, that, as many of you know, uh, was essentially a limited access highway that only allowed a certain number of entrances and exits because its genesis was um, to be a, a, a highway from UMass to, I believe it was, Bay Road. It was going to be 116. Um, that never came to fruition. And on this side of Route 9, University Drive South, it has that dead end that really goes to nowhere. I think it might be used for maybe trash collection or um, some some snow storage. And so we were dealing with a relatively unique, uh, one of a kind road. And then I think you're probably all familiar with traveling on that road. Um, and I think Jason saw an opportunity, and he's here obviously to um, speak to that, but saw an opportunity for substantial improvements. And after we started to discuss the roundabout, we also started to discuss parking. And so really, through iterations, uh, you have the plan that you see in front of you today. So as, as Mr. Zomek mentioned, the, the project was approved as a 45 unit, um, three story building with about 4,700 square feet of commercial space. The commercial space is tucked into the uh, northern side of the site. Um, facing onto Route 9. And then out of those 45 units, there are 32 studios and 13 one bedrooms. And as Mr. Zomek mentioned, there are five uh, affordable units uh, proposed as well. That use is supported by 44 on site parking spaces. And then uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals, as you see um, in the memo from the town manager, um, required as a certain conditions approval of these off-site parking spaces and so on your screen you'll see the purple spaces those are the eight on-street parking spaces and then in the lighter yellow there are 12 in, in that dead end space there are 12 additional parking spaces um, there is also a proposal for a sidewalk that if, if you zoom in, it, it runs the entirety of University Drive South on that westerly side along those uh, parking spaces. There's also um, some plantings proposed in that dead end uh, public way, but then the balance of the uh, plantings will be on private property. There's also um, going to be some pedestrian lighting along that sidewalk as well. Um, I'm happy to screen share. I've got some, some other slides that I can show. There, there's obviously no need to. It, it seems like from reading your motions that we'll be back, uh, we'll likely be back either at the TSO or at a June 29th uh, hearing. And, and obviously we're happy to provide more information then. Uh, I'm happy to get into any other details of the project to talk about the roundabout, but that's Generally, it's genesis and um, how we got to where we are today. David, are there other presentations on this? Um, there are not. We wanted to try to keep it brief and leave time for questions. Um, okay. I do think I know that the council had in their packet from the previous meeting, there were a few renderings that um, I found very helpful if the council would find those helpful. Again, I'm sure Mr. Reedy could speak to those, um, but there, um, there are some renderings of the building that I believe Kuhn Riddle Architects uh, did that might yes, be yes. helpful. Um, Sean, those are, that is the additional packet that we discussed earlier today. I've got them up now. Do you want to just, uh, they're Thank graphical, you. so they take a minute to load, but if you want to just tell me next, <clears throat> next, David, I'll, I'll run through them. David, I'm, I'm happy to take yeah, this. I would, I would leave that to Mr. Reedy. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, so a lot of these, as Dave mentioned, we had Kuhn Riddle Architects uh, design the building. Um, and so we also asked them to do some context renderings. Uh, most of them are pretty self-explanatory. This one is uh, on Route 9 traveling east, and this is obviously uh, after construction. If you'd like to go to the next slide. So this is pre-construction. 
Uh, I'll draw your attention to the left side of the screen. You can see the intersection of University Drive South and Route 9. And then if you go to the next slide, and then you'll see what it would look like with the three-story building um, instead of that single family home. Next slide, please. This is from Baker Street. So this is to the southeast of the project. Uh, you'll see if you, if you look, uh, you'll notice a yellow sign. Uh, you'll see the roundabout. There looks to be a green car in the distance. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, the roundabout's creation. And then you'll also see uh, the building and, and what it would look like from Baker Street. So certainly tucked away uh, from the view of Baker Street. You'll also see some of that landscaping that I had mentioned. Uh, it's on the left side of the screen. You'll see some of those pines, uh, some of those evergreens that would be planted. Uh, next slide, please. This is, this is one of the better ones because you can see existing conditions. You can see the width of University Drive South being uh, 100 feet wide. It's got that boulevard in the middle. And then you can see that dead end. Um, you can also see the wear on the pavement from uh, vehicles traveling in that direction. Um, you know, ultimately, we believe that the roundabout is a traffic calming measure. It's going to give more stability to that intersection, more predictability to the intersection, um, hoping that it will calm Snell Street, folks coming, traveling uh, west on Snell Street, and also those folks coming University Drive and traveling east on Snell Street. We'll have to take a step back and think a little, about, think a little bit about the traffic movement that they're gonna make. Next slide, please. And so there you'll see, um, the property as improved, you'll see that you can see the sidewalk that's being proposed along those eight on street parking spaces. You'll see, um, I'll call them bump outs, uh, those, the grassy areas um, at each of the bookends of the eight meter parking or those eight on street parking spaces um, to provide appropriate protection for those vehicles. Uh, I believe that from the Easterly side of the parallel spaces to the median is about 21 feet, um, which I think, you know, Jason can talk to if you need him to, but we think is more than sufficient width for vehicles to both parallel park and to still allow vehicles to, to travel beyond um, that parking vehicle. And then further in the distance, you'll see the roundabout um, with the additional landscaping. Next slide, please. Again, from, this is a view from the south, probably more focused on that roundabout. Next slide, please. And so you can see the creation of the roundabout um, and that additional parking. If you're familiar with the site, there's a, there's a existing tree line um, that is pretty well marked. That tree line is not changing. That is not coming down at all. So if you're driving by for point of reference, um, you know, you can see that that tree line will continue to exist. Uh, next slide, please. So just a, a view from the intersection, existing single family home, and next slide, please. And this is the proposed building. You'll notice that there's no curb cut off of Route 9. There is an existing driveway off of Route 9, but through discussions with the planning department and neighbors, we decided that it was best to eliminate that uh, driveway and so access to and exit from the site will all occur from that University Drive South Snell Street roundabout entrance. Uh, next slide, please. Again, from uh, across the street, next slide, please. And the proposed building. Next slide, please. And these are just showing some comparative heights, probably more useful for the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board when we were talking to them about some of the surrounding, the heights of the, the surrounding buildings and that this was in concert with those. So I don't know, uh, I recall this presentation from the meeting a couple of weeks ago. I don't know that there are any more slides that are useful. Um, I do have on my screen some details of the roundabout, should anybody be interested. Uh, and I've got the lighting plan, but absent any 
particular questions on those, I'm, I'm happy to take general questions. Okay. Uh, Dorothy, you have your hand up. Okay. Um, this question, um, I realize that it's, it's um, not exactly part of this prob problem, but you have the sidewalk in front of the building, which is nice, and then you have the roundabout. Um, this is there's a there is commercial space, but there's a lot of residents in this in this building, and I would think if they wanted to take a walk, they would not want to walk along Route Nine, um, but they would want to walk along the continuation of of um, I guess it's Snell Street, and I don't think there are any sidewalks on that. So I'm just wondering if um, you had thought about um, sidewalks, kind of connecting it to a way so they would so people could have some place to walk beside the parking lot in Route Nine. Sure. So if I may, if we want to go back maybe three or four slides mm -hmm. to one of the aerials. Yeah. That's probably, that's good. That's a good enough one. So you'll see that, yes, you've got that sidewalk along University Drive South. And then I think what you have to remember is there's that crosswalk. And so part of that Route 9 is going to be improved by Mass DOT. I think they're doing a complete streets project mm -hmm. from this intersection all the way up to um, the top of the hill, uh, South Pleasant Street. But okay. you've got that sidewalk and it leads to the crosswalk. And then if, if you look on the easterly side where that crosswalk terminates, that mm -hmm. is uh, the swift connector. So that's the bike trail. Okay. And so the thought was, instead of having folks walk up and down Snell Street, which is not the widest road, especially mm -hmm. as you start to get up towards that railroad, the former railroad bridge, was mm -hmm. to route folks towards Route 9, but then to utilize the crosswalk, especially because it's going to be improved through that DOT mm -hmm. process, and to access the bike path um, okay. for walking. Okay. That's, thank you. Sure. Andy Joe. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation. I, I just want to, I, I, as I was drafting the motion that, that might come before us later and trying to figure out whether our bylaws on parking regulations applied, um, I, I was looking at the vote of the ZBA and I just wanted some confirmation um, that a vote to approve this as it's listed in the ZBA sort of statement of decisions is a vote to actually approve the regulation of those parking spaces in the public way as presented in the first slide you had. Um, the eight along the side that would be metered if we vote for this, they would be metered. And then the 12 would be, I'm calling them semi-public -pub and semi-private, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for office visitor use, 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. for resident only use, even though they're in the public way. Um, and so I guess my question is to confirm that that's what we would be approving. And if we didn't like that particular regulation, would, would that, you know, and we wanted to change that, say we didn't want to metered or something, um, would that any pot potential change of those conditions listed in that first slide result in a ruling that the special permit could not be issued because the way I read the special permit decision is that we have to vote as presented. So I'm just looking for confirmation as to what if say we didn't want them metered, those eight along the street non-metered say, would that result in the special permit not being able to be issued? Great question. Ultimately, I, I think that's a question for the building commissioner. I think there was thought behind having those spaces uh, along University Drive South metered, you know, something like one to two hours um, to prevent folks from coming, parking, staying, whether they're involved with this project or parking there and going to UMass or Amherst College or, or somewhere else. Um, whether it would void or require us to go back, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I think what we would be looking for is, you know, on that on-street parking, probably a mix of metered and then and then permit spaces. You know, maybe eight to five for metered, and then five to eight for permit, and then that dead end parking area. I think we would look for permit spaces there um, as well. And so, based on your reading of the the bylaw, whether or not that would be a regulation by town council of parking, 
you know, I think would determine your next steps and whether or not you have to hold that public hearing. Do, do we have, I don't know, is Rob still on this? And I don't see him on this. Um, I'm just hoping no. we can get an answer as to whether if we change, if, if we don't want it metered. I'm using that one because that's the easiest example, but there's also the 12 spots that are eight to five, presumably public use for use of the building, but then 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. completely private use. Um, and if we don't like that, say split, does that jeopardize the issuance of the ZBA special permit is one of the questions. I'm, I'm, I'd really like an answer to that. Yeah, so I mean, I think if, if that's the way you're looking at it, um, yes, I think it would jeopardize because if, I think what the, the Zoning Board of Appeals felt comfortable understanding that there would be those 12 spaces that uh, essentially there would be use of, you know, assumedly permit parking. So the uh, project owner, you know, Barry would buy the permit spaces and then be able to divvy it up, whether it's 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and then 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. And then also in consideration of those additional parking spaces along University Drive South, I think the existence of those parking spaces and the, the regulation of them made the Zoning Board of Appeals feel comfortable enough that there would be sufficient parking. Our position was we think we have sufficient parking, but I think they thought with those, you certainly will have sufficient parking. Thank you. Um, Mandy Joe, is there anything to follow up on that? Nope, that, that answered my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Darcy, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I, I just wondered uh, if you could talk a little bit about what you have looked at around sustainability for this whole project and especially um, uh, in the parking lot, for example, have you um, considered having electric car charging stations and have you considered having um, the building be solar ready or solar equipped? Um, you know, what are you doing for heating of the units and all of those questions? Sure. Um... So probably the, the electric vehicle charging station first. Um, so Barry has experience. 70 University Drive, which is just down the street, uh, was an a, approved mixed use building. He put in an electric vehicle charging station there. Um, and I guess simply put, there are plenty of strings attached, um, costs, et cetera, and frankly has not seen the use. Um, so I don't think he would be inclined, he explored it, but I don't think he'd be inclined to put that electric vehicle charging station here. Um, in the way that the building is heated, it's going to be heated and cooled through mini splits. Um, and so you, you, if you look at the building, you can see, and maybe a side view would be better, but there's, you see the exterior of the roof, you know, um, and then a little bit in, you see, uh, almost like a parapet. And then what would be inside of, or, yeah, we're getting there. Um, maybe, yeah, that's probably good. So if you look at the, you see the side of the building and then stepped back a, a few feet, you can see uh, a higher roof line. And behind those will be all the mini split units. And so everything will be high efficiency, uh, energy heating and cooling. Um, and so because of that, we can't put solar on the roof because that's where we're putting um, all the mini split units. I mean, it, it really is a very energy efficient building. It'll meet the stretch energy code um, um, if you go to 70 University Drive, you could probably, it's so, it'll be somewhat similar in, in construction. And it's just, it's a very tight building, um, especially without uh, gas. So there's obviously, you know, about the gas moratorium. And so the building is not able to be heated by gas. So that's why they're using the mini splits um, on, the, on the roof. You could have your hand up. Is there something you'd like to add to the discussion that we're having right now before I call on the next person? Sure. I just wanted to um, reemphasize the, the company, uh, what Mandy was asking about with Tom. And I, I think he characterized the, the uh, outcome of the ZBA process that um, in off street parking in combination 
are a critical component to the project. But I think what I wanted to emphasize is that both of them, you know, again, we, I think the applicant is requesting use of the public way. Uh, the, the applicant is requesting to improve the public way. I think we, that's some, one thing that may not have been emphasized here is that all the improvements that you see before you tonight and in the packet would be provided by the project, by the applicant. So the roundabout, uh, the sidewalks, the plantings, uh, the parking, both on street and off street would all be provided by the applicants. Um, the other piece of this is that both the set of eight and set of 12 spaces would be revenue generating for the town. And I guess our goal, I think the goal tonight was not to get into the specifics of that, but if you will, that would be something that Paul could pursue in the future with the applicant if you agreed in concept that the on-street parking and the off-street parking was appropriate and an appropriate use of the public way that um, the town manager could negotiate with um, uh, Mr. Roberts and, and his partners on, on a fee system for that, uh, be it a combination of permit and obviously the metered parking. And then we would, our uh, parking enforcement folks would uh, monitor the, the on-street parking. Um, and, um, you know, we would, we would work together with, with Mr. Roberts and his partners in the future on that. So, so I just wanted to emphasize the revenue piece. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, if there are any other questions about the process itself, I know Christine Brestrup is on this call, so um, we could pull her in if necessary. Thanks. Kathy Shane, you have your hand up. Yeah, can you go back to the aerial view that you used uh, when Dorothy was asked about walking that looked down at the building? That one, yeah. So mine was about walking. Um, but walking to stores, because uh, I believe this is right near where we've also, um, we've got the old Amherst Motel turning into a taller building with some affordable units. And then up nearer to town, um, 132 Northampton Road will be a large complex with all affordable units. And some of the discussion of that is that people could walk to shop and I heard you say that, and we've heard this before, the DOT has a master plan for the roads here, um, complete streets. And you can see that sidewalk, if I was to be on this building side, is a small sidewalk um, if I wanted to ride my bike. So biking or walking, or if I wanted to go to stop and shop, I have to cross the street, or I want to go to Big Y, I have to cross the street. So just describe a little bit what how you think DOT is going to redo this and if people don't want to have a car because this is actually a great location for being able to walk to shop except that walking would be quite unpleasant the way it's currently configured I mean not um, so getting to one of the stores and the quarter of a mile up the road where people were hoping to have, you know, pulley things with shopping carts. So it's this unit and the other unit. So there's a bunch of units that would benefit from an ability to walk along Route 9 or cross Route 9 to go to food stores. Sure. And, and maybe Jason could talk a little bit more about what DOT is proposing for the complete streets. I, I know that it is an upgrade to some of the, some of the signalization at the crosswalks. And so from this site, the sidewalk that you see is a, it's a five foot sidewalk um, that ends at that uh, corner. So the Northeast corner of the site. And then there are obviously crosswalks, three different crosswalks. Um, if you wanted to get over to Ginger Garden, you could go across those three crosswalks or two crosswalks to get along University Drive. And then that's mm -hmm. uh, the swift way. That's the swift connector. So you could go along University Drive. Um, the complete streets, frankly, I'm, I know that they will have a bike lane. I believe it's also a sidewalk. Um, yes. Oh, go ahead. Jason, you want me to chime in, Tom? Sure, please. please. Okay, sorry to interrupt. No. Um, so yeah, the complete streets, their design isn't hundred percent yet but they do have sidewalks on both sides they're still working on the final elements of the intersection um, but there will be at least on Northampton Road there will be bike lanes 
Um, going in towards Amherst, there will be sidewalks on both sides, uh, full five foot sidewalks with grass belts. Um, but again, I don't, they have not finalized on the intersection yet and they're still working out the finer details. So I don't know that, I, I believe a fourth crosswalk would go in so that there would be crosswalks across all four legs of the intersection, but I don't know for sure yet. Are they aware of this building and the other buildings as they're thinking of where the placement is and what the access is? So it just, um, I realize the, this builder is not doing this, but rather than DOT comes along with its own idea and, and you could imagine that some things would work better than others for giving biking and walking access either into town or to uh, food stores. Right, so DOT, um, all of these developments had, have had to um, submit sort of an impact statement to DOT since Northampton Road is a DOT road. Um, so DOT is fully aware of the proposed developments as they, as they stand. I guess my question is, will they integrate those kinds of needs into the, con I mean, do, do we have a conversation with them where everyone, I guess we're in the Zoom world now, but I think of sitting in the room saying, let's talk about if you do it this way versus that way, is that just a separate process? It's definitely a separate process and they're still, I think they're still at the pre 75% design. So there'll still be more public hearings with the OT to present their next level of design. Um, so there's plenty of opportunities for folks to show up and, and the town to show up and say, we'd like a fourth crosswalk or we really insist on bike lanes or you know whatever, whatever it is we feel is important, we, we have the opportunity to throw in there. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I, I want to go back to the question before us. It's about this project. As Jason has pointed out, there'll be opportunity uh, for the other uh, complete streets thing with Route 9. Are there any other questions from the council at this time? All right. So there is a variety of options here. And both Alyssa and Mandy Jo have weighed in on them. So let me start with Mandy Jo and then ask whether, where, which way we want to go. Mandy Jo? Yeah, so I, there's a bylaw that requires us to hold a hearing. Um, I think the motion sheet has sort of my comments on this. Um, and so I think we're required to hold that hearing because the plan indicates the parking would be regulated. And the bylaw talks about the regulation of parking. Um, so I think just to be safe, we'd want to hold a hearing. So I would not, I, I am not in favor of voting to suspend the rules to vote tonight, simply because I want to make sure we comply with the bylaw. So my preference is to vote to hold the hearing or set the hearing date. I don't know whether we need to vote to hold the hearing, but I would argue we should be setting a hearing date. Alyssa? I agree with Mandy Joe. I think this is one of those process things we're still working out and that it definitely, I agree with her interpretation that we need a hearing, much as it frustrates me <laughs> if we need to push something out. But I think it's entirely appropriate for the town council to agree that we'll be ready to have that hearing, whatever the earliest date is. Chris always tells us how much lead time we need to get things published. And you guys have probably already talked about that. But I do not want to see it get referred to TSO. I think we've had an adequate conversation here. And in fact, since we're going to have a hearing, there's even more opportunity for some of that presentation to be fine-tuned for the for presentation to the public at the hearing. Um, I believe that the motion would be to advise the president to set this hearing date. Um, and am I correct on that, Mandy Jo? Or the I, mean, I, I drafted a motion that said to hold the hearing on a certain date. And then I didn't have a time in there, but it's it's your decision whether you wanted a motion to hold or a motion to advise you to hold. I don't care. Uh, so why don't you make the motion and the date is fine. Uh, what time? 630. Okay. 
So I move to hold a hearing pursuant to general bylaw 3.14 on June 29, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. Regarding the regulations governing the location, time, and duration of parking on University Drive South pursuant to the approved plans referred to in ZBA 2020-26 special permit decision. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Okay, then I'm going to move to a roll call vote. I'm going to start with Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Stanley Balmilne. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Yeah, Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. He votes 12 0, 0 with one with one absence. I believe that those are the only motions with regard to this particular event. And uh, we will then bring up the motion to approve after the hearing. Perfect. Correct? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to our staff for all your work on this. You are welcome. Thank you all. Okay, we are going to, let me just organize here. Um, we're going on to the amendment to zoning bylaw 11.250 regarding votes required for planning board decision. This is a vote to refer. It was on the cons consent agenda, but at the request of a counselor, it has been pulled off. Um, would you please show the motion on the screen, Sean? It's very brief. And enlarge that, please. So basically, um, some other counselor can chime in, but what happened is when the zoning, when the um, planning board was reduced in size in the um, charter, they did not change the vote uh, that were needed in order to do site plan applications. And that's what this uh, zoning bylaw would do. This is a referral of this bylaw to CRC and planning board, and they would have a hearing on it. At what point, Mandy Jo? We are scheduled to hold a hearing on this on June 17th okay. at 6.35 p.m. So are there questions? Yes. Darcy, did you have a question? Yes. <laughs> um, what's the purpose of the change? So um, if I may, Lynn? Please. So before we adopted a new charter, the planning board had nine members. And so this has a but not fewer than five and a two thirds. It now has seven members. So we reduced the, seven, the nine to seven, but that number never changed. It still requires five. This is for site plan review. Um, there's a difference between site plan review and special permits. Site plan reviews are the review of a proposed use of a piece of land that is allowed by right. Um, I'm using a lot of jargon here. I'm not sure Steve would probably better be able to explain it, but a use allowed by right is a use allowed just in the normal circumstances. Um, so in a residential neighborhood, it is a use for a resident, say a single family home. In a commercial district, it might be the use as a restaurant. Um, there's a whole table and chart that says what the by right uses are. Um, in a professional research park, it might be a medical office. And that, that if that's what you want to build, that use is allowed automatically. Um, and so the site plan review is, is a less rigorous review than a special permit, which is requesting a use that is not allowed by right under those use charts. Um, and so 
the, the change is twofold. Um, one would be to remove the not fewer than five, recognizing that the planning board went from nine to seven. Five was a, a majority of the planning board at the time it was written. It is now a super majority of the planning board um, because the planning board only has seven members. And it would change the voting quantum down from two thirds to a majority, which uh, my understanding in speaking with um, people in planning is the standard in planning, um, in zoning and planning right now for site plan review. It is the type, it is this voting quantum that Northampton uses. And um, it is a, and, and what I will say is the planning board has not fully discussed this particular wording yet. Um, that's what the referral is for. The CRC has not fully discussed this particular wording. We looked at a chart of what a, a couple of different different options and there was a leaning towards majority, but it has not been talked about nor voted on at CRC. We would not vote until after a public hearing. Kathy Shane, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm focused on the wording um, and I realize this is a referral, but the way this is worded now, um, since we, um, it, you do a majority, it's of the members participating. So if I take an example, if seven people are participating, I mean, are not, if we're only six participating or four, so that they have enough to go ahead and you don't count an abstaining group, we don't have any minimum. So a majority or at least three. So you could have two people if there are four people there and one abstains or three people there and one abstains. So I, th I think we need to consider like how, how few, what's a quorum of the board and if someone abstains, because the wording doesn't have a minimum. And I can see why we might not want to have five as the, the number anymore. But when you're discussing this, um, the other did it in two ways to protect the if someone wasn't there that day or two people weren't do it there that day or one person wasn't sure to get down to a smaller and smaller number. And this wording leaves you open to a very small number of people wanting to do this if some people are absent. Steve Schreiber, you have your hand up. Would you like to address the question? I, I had it up and I had it down. But uh, I mean, Kathy's, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Kathy's hitting on an important point. So um, um, a quorum would be four people, and this is not, this is going to be referred, but you, you know, four would be a quorum, and then a majority of four would be three, right? But that's what democracy is also. So that's a basic principle of democracy is that those who vote, I mean, those who show up are the ones that get to vote, and then typically the majority of those voting are the ones that make decisions. So we see examples of that throughout democracy. So again, this is a by right use. So it's basically by right with with some input from the planning board. But just Steve, I just want clarification. So th I'm comfortable with three, but I read this is we don't count an abstaining member. So if four people mm. are there and one abstains, then we're down to three and a majority would be two. I mean, that's the way I read the words. Um, so a majority of three would be two. Steve. You mute, Steve, you muted yourself. Yep, yep, yep. So democracy, um, you abstain, you're there, but you're giving up your vote. That's, so, you know, in theory, you could have, um, everyone could abstain, right? So for what, so the vote could be one to, one person voting, everybody else abstaining, and that, that would, um, you know, I'm speaking off the cuff, but if people are willing to get their vote by abstaining, that would be the result, yes. Alyssa? Yeah, I, I got lost when we decided that quorum was no longer five. I mean, it's a seven men or planning board. Quorum's always going to be five. If, as was indicated, three of those people decide to abstain, that's the same as always. So, so where did we, how did we get from five? You can't change the quorum requirement. What? <laughs> I'm, I doesn't make Quorum's not five on a five seven four. planning board. Quorum is four. Okay, so we're talking about mainly your, your concern that if quorum is only four, that you're saying only four people potentially have the 
ability to make a decision instead of if the seven had shown up. Am I understanding that correctly? You're just no, that four should be allowed to so, make such so a So a planning board can hold a hearing and a meeting with four people present, not all seven. Um, at this point, the way this bylaw is written, they could not actually vote at all on that because they don't even have enough there to get to the five. Um, but they could still hold the hearings because they have a quorum present. Um, I think what Steve was saying is if four are there and four have attended, you know, there's all these different rules about how, how many, you have to be at all the hearings to be able to vote and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And all, if, if only four meet that requirement, um, this would allow, if all four are using their vote, three people to pass the site plan review. Steve, you have your hand up again. Yeah, and I always thought it was ironic that the Zoning Board of Appeals, which has discretion, can say no, used to be a three-person body. So we, um, and then the Planning Board, which typically doesn't deal with discretionary permits, was a nine-person body. And that was one of the reasons that the Charter Commission made that change, or recommended that change that was passed by the voters. This is a vote to refer. I think it's been useful that we discuss it because once it's referred and the hearing is held, it will come back to us with a recommendation and we will vote on it. So is there any other discussion at this time? All right, then um, I believe we have the motion is to refer the proposed amendment to zoning bylaw 11.250 to the planning board and the community resources committee to hold joint hearings and provide a recommendation to the town council within 90 days is there a second second all right and any more conversation then we'll move to a, a roll call vote evan ross yes ryan yes shane yes driver Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Paul Milne. Yes. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. Pat DeAngelis. I. She's mouthing yes. Pat. <laughs> Pat, you need to unmute. You're clicking too much. To me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alyssa. <laughs> Yvonne. Yes. Reese Mers, yes. Haneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. It's unanimous 12001 absent. Um, we're moving on to the town council policy regarding the control and regulation of the pub public way, section 3B. Uh, this was um, on the consent agenda, but it was removed. And so we do need to start with a vote to suspend rules of procedure 8.4 for this item. Let me just point out that this is um the item that is related to the um zoning temporary zoning bylaw that has been uh forwarded it's already been heard by gol and it's and discussed by gol and by um tsl Town services committee and um we will at some point have them speak to this as well but let's start with a need. We need to suspend town council rule of procedure, rule 8.4 for the current agenda item. Is there a second? second. Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, motion's been made and seconded. We start with George Ryan. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Darcy. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't. Forgot you could hear me. Um, I, again, I, I was the person who asked to take this off the consent agenda um, because I I think it there is no rush. 
we don't have to, we can do this two weeks from now. Um, I, I actually feel like um, we need, we need to um, see if there's any other input from the public uh, by waiting for those two weeks. And I'm especially interested in making sure that if anybody from the disability community wants to weigh in, that they have the opportunity to do so. Um, Shalini and I did hear at our District 5 meeting from a concerned person who's wheelchair bound with a few questions about um, what the new situation is going to look like downtown if we do this. Um, so I think that it just would be good to have the time to allow people to be reassured if they have concerns. And that's why I would vote against. Um, okay. Is there any other comment at this time? Okay, so there is a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded, and it's to suspend town council rules of procedure 8.4 for the current agenda item. Let me mention that we did hear earlier that there, they will have to abide by all the handicap accessibility rules and that we've been assured that that is part of the process of approval. Um, so I just want to point out that that's been addressed in an earlier conversation this evening. Motion's been made and seconded. We'll go with a roll call vote. We'll start with Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. No. Lynn Griesmerzy, yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. And George Ryan. Yes. It's 11 in favor, one against, no abstentions, and one absent. So now we're going to move on to the larger question. And before we do that, I would like both um, to hear from both GOL and from the town services. Let's start with George. Thank you, Lynn. I wonder if you could, uh, if Sean could put up the slide so people can see the language. Thank you. Um, right there. And, sorry. So the language you see in front of you um, was crafted uh, by GOL, actually uh, with the, actually through Mandy's hard work. And I'm gonna ask her if she's willing uh, to speak to it specifically as to the nature of the language and why we uh, made it a separate item, item four. Um, she's already spoken to this once today, so she's warmed up, but hopefully she will uh, be kind enough to speak to it directly. But this language was developed at GOL and then it was sent to TSO for TSO to review, but I think she should speak to it first if she's willing. I'm willing. Thank Lynn. you. <laughs> Please go right ahead. So um, I, I proposed this instead of the, the town manager had proposed a change to only the long-term, uh, no, the short-term closure, um, long-term closure of one of them. I think it was short-term sidewalk closures um, and or long-term sidewalk closures. And in reading our public ways policy, I realized uh, if restaurants are looking to uh, operate in our public way for public seating for outdoor eating, um, which was the goal of some of the temporary zoning and and granting the town manager the um, authority to delegating the authority to the town manager to grant those requests in the public way that those requests might not come for under 14 days, which is a short term closure. They might be longer than 14 days, which would be a long term closure of a sidewalk or use um, or they might be for a road or a parking meet a parking spot which would be under the item section two, reservation of public ways, short-term requests and long-term requests under 14 days, over 14 days, maybe they'll choose to use a 
a, a parking space in front of theirs on North Pleasant Street, say, for an example. I don't know. Um, and instead of adding the, the, the town manager's language into all of those sections that, that might apply um, for long-term requests and short-term requests for parking and roads and sidewalks, um, I thought it was simpler and more clear if all we did was add a full section that dealt with Article 14 temporary zoning related requests um, and, and, you know, sort of applied it to parking, road, um, sidewalks, closures, um, and all of that for short or long term as long as they're temporary, not permanent. Um, and that they could not be granted for longer than the bylaw is um, in place, essentially. Um, so the bylaw is set to sunset. If it passes, it sunsets 180 days after it passes. So this would grant the town manager the authority to grant approvals up to that 180 day mark. Um, and so, but I thought it would be clearer to be a separate section so that people know what they're looking at if they're looking at this policy and that the manager knows exactly what he's allowed to do. Thank you, Mandy. And then we passed this 5-0 um, and then shipped it off to TSO. Okay, TSO, Dorothy, Darcy. Uh, yes, we, we also uh, passed it 5-0 uh, to zero with, uh, uh, as amended by GOL. So our, our uh, the, uh, hearing, our presentation was by Mandy Jo and she basically told us what she just told the rest of the council. Um, the only deliberation was um, me bringing up the issue about uh, getting um, input from the disability community. Um, and um, Paul, Rob Mora and Christine Brestrup um, responded that they would be looking at um, and following ADA um, requirements. Okay. Is there any question? All right, then there is a motion. The motion is to amend the town council policy regarding the control and regulation of the public ways by adding a new section for zoning bylaw article 14 temporary zoning related requests and renumbering the current section four miscellaneous to section five is there a second second is there any other further discussion darcy I, I just want to say that I, I support this, but I'm going to vote against it because I don't feel, I feel like we should be having a second um, reading of it. Okay. Are there any other, does any other discussion at this time? All right, then I'm going to begin with, I guess, Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Balmel. Yes. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. No. Greesmers, yes. Haneke. Mindy Jo. Sorry, yes. I forgot to unmute myself. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. And uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Votes 11, uh, four, one against, no abstentions and one absent. We have already taken care of item E and F in the consent agenda. And so we're going to move on to C, um, G. And G is a straight charter requirement. It requires that we agree that we need to consider the regional school budget off cycle. We did this last year and it's straightforward, fairly routine, but we wanted to make sure that we go ahead and vote it. Are there questions before I put the motion? Okay. In accordance with section 
5.5C of the Amherst Home Rule Charter and in compliance with Section 5.5A and 5.5B of the Amherst Home Rule Charter um, to separate, we're moving to separately consider and act on the Amherst Pelham Regional School District budget for fiscal year 2021 due to the agreement with the three other towns in the regional school district. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All right, then moving to a roll call vote. Steinberg. Yes. Paul Milne. Yes. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. Yes. Greesmers, yes. Haneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Shriver. Yes. It's 12 zero, zero, 001 absent. Okay. Uh, the next item is was done in the consent agenda and it was to on the Community Preservation Act. And we now move to item I on the agenda. And it's the M amendment with regard to Town Council Rules of Procedure 4.2. Proposed rule 4.6 regarding use of the consent agenda. And would you, Sean, would you please put it up on the screen? Let me just say this has been before the council before. It basically put formalizes the consent agenda, which we've been, if you will, trying out for the last couple of several meetings now. And it's particularly been very useful recently. So um, the motion is to amend the Town Council Rules of Procedure Rule 4.2 and add new Rule 4.6 as shown in the document titled Rules of Procedure Consent Agenda Revisions 2020-05-6 as recommended by GOL. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Alyssa, you have your hand up. I'm confused and I'm trying to peer at Mandy Jo through the little tiny screen. Wasn't this <laughs> still on the consent agenda? I don't remember anyone pulling this out. Uh, it was called out. It did. Oh, okay. My mistake. I thought I wrote down some, I must have written down something different. Thank you. It was called out. Okay. Is there any discussion at this time? Darcy, please use your hand raising things. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't um, reach it because there's a bar over my participant icon. Don't know why. Um, All right, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Um, I, I have a simple um, issue with this, and that is that, that um, especially with Zoom meetings, I find it kind of nerve wracking to, um, to be ready with whatever um, we're doing around consent agendas. And, and I feel like we should, uh, I know at, at least one time in the past, a counselor has contacted the president in advance of the meeting and just said, um, please take this off the consent agenda. So I think that we should be able to do that um, because um, I, I find it super nerve wracking to be ready to do that when there's plenty of time beforehand to be able to just email and say, um, please take that off the consent agenda. Um, so Darcy, let me speak to that. I'm glad to receive uh, questions or comments or statements that I would like to be able to remove this from the consent agenda and even for that matter, explain why it's on there. Uh, but at the same time, you have to ask for renewal in the meeting. You ask, have to ask for removal in the meeting. Why? It's a requirement of open meeting law. You can't ask for removal, removal of an item are taking an item off the consent agenda through an email without being in the public. You can warn me that you're going to ask for that. 
but you need to ask for it in the public meeting. So what I've been trying to do is make sure that I go through the list very slowly, explain why they're there, and then deliberately go back and say, who would like to remove items? Okay. Any further discussion on that? Okay, then um, motion's been made and did I get a second? Yes, I did. Any further discussion? Okay, then we are back to Ball Melm. Yes. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. Yes. Reesmer. Yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Mo the motion passes 12 4 0, 0 1 absent. And we are now moving on. And gang, we are on time. Are very close to it. Um, are we never taking a break in this meeting, Lynn? <laughs> we actually, if people need to take a break, they should just exit out and take it. We are so close to being done. Let's just keep moving. Um, there was a question as to whether or not um, this next item, which is the letter in your, the, this comes under 13B, the 48 hour rule. And th this is a letter to Desi. And there's been a question raised by both Andy and Mandy Joe as to whether or not it's appropriate that the council does this letter or should the town manager be doing this letter. And uh, I was asked by Doug Slaughter to bring it to the council, but then both Mandy Joe and Andy have raised the question based on the guidance from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education as to whether or not this is really the town manager. So, Andy or Mandy Joe, you want to speak to that? Mandy Joe? I mean, the guidance says that the letter would come from the select board or the mayor of a town or a city. Both of those individuals or groups are the head executive of the city um, or towns. Um, right. We are not the head executive, so that would be the town manager. However, um, because the deadline in theory is today, and if we are unsure whether it needs to be the manager or the council, I would argue we should vote and that the manager should also sign a letter and then we will have both <laughs> for whichever is required. Great. So then would you please put the letter up on the screen? And this literally the language was straight out of the email I received from Doug Slaughter from the school district. And it's to say that we agree that the Amherst Pelham Regional School District can seek a 112th budget. And we have to record our vote. Is there any further discussion? Then what you want, um, the motion should be to authorize the president to sign the letter and approve this. Andy, Joe, you want to try a motion? I don't seem to have one. The the motion that, that was drafted and in our packet is to authorize the president to sign the FY21 letter of support for regional schools, Amherst Town Council, June 1st, 2020. Okay, there's been a motion. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Okay. Uh, further discussion, Dorothy, Pam? Okay. Dorothy? Yes, um, I'm, I'm, the last sentence, we acknowledge that the district's 112 budget will be calculated using the statutory method 
if any member town fails to pass the 2021 budget. Okay, so we're gonna pass the 112 budget now and the others haven't done that yet. So I'm just confused about how the time, how those ideas fit together in time. Andy, you'd like to address that, please. Yes, um, we don't actually pass the 112 budget for the purposes of a regional school district. Uh, the, re the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education imposes a 112 budget if the four the towns in the region, in this case, four towns can't agree on the budget on time for the start of the fiscal year under the <clears throat> standard procedures. Um, this being a very unusual year, um, mm -hmm. it raised a series of questions, one of which was what happens to the assessment method. The uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has a long-standing policy on the issue, which they ap apply in years where there's been a failure to reach an agreement <coughs> because of problems that the towns had and uh, in reaching an agreement. And that automatically then defaulted to the statutory method because of the unusual circumstances, they uh, created the ability, which hadn't existed before, to get, <coughs> excuse me, to an alternative method. Mm -hmm. That's what this is. Uh, but so you have a question. We won't do that until after now. That's, we're, we're okaying the 112 budget now, and we'll find out whether we have a problem or later. We don't pass a 112 budget if we don't, if all, four, if the towns, the other towns are unable to schedule town meetings on a timely basis and it misses the date um, of June 30th so that we're in a position that there is no budget for the year um, as it begins, then a 112 budget becomes necessary and will be as I said earlier, imposed by uh, DESE, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, but it only comes to play if we fail to pass the budget on time. If, we pay, if, if the other towns can get their town meetings, we certainly can get a council meeting because we meet right. on a regular basis and then the assessment method will be voted in the normal course of business as for the budget. Okay, thank you. Okay, Alyssa. Yeah, my, my, my concern is just exceedingly minor, but if you were to just read the title of this motion, you would have no idea what it means to say we support the regional schools. So could, would Andy, what would be the right wording for that to support the regional schools budget assessment to support the regional schools 112 budget assessment, it needs to have words not support regional schools. That's all. We need a amendment. I have to look at the, the motion is it exactly worded, but it's to um, support the alternative assessment method as proposed by the regional school committee. In, in doing a 112 budget? Yes, the Regional School Committee, of course, has proposed that um, method um, for our consideration when we actually get to the full year budget. That was the agreement that was made through the four towns meetings. And um, so it's adopting the agreement that we made at the four towns meeting, which has been put forward now for consideration at town meetings by the council with the regular budget pursuant to the agreement made in the four town process. And uh, this will allow that to be ad um, adopted by DESE should a 112 budget become necessary. So Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. I assume you're going to state a friendly amendment. 
since I made the amendment, um, I am happy to add the words to support the alternative assessment method as proposed by the regional school committee to the end of the motion so that the motion reads to authorize the president to sign the FY21 letter of support for regional schools Amherst Town Council June 1, 2020 to support the alternative assessment method as, per, as proposed by the regional school committee. And the person that seconded it? That was Pat. Except, Pat, accept that motion change? Yes. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Okay, a roll call vote. Then we are going to start with Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. Yes. Reesmers, yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. And Ball Milne. Yes. So it's 12 0, 0, 1 absent. Thank you. We are now moving on to the appointments. The town manager appointments are not being dealt with tonight, but we are dealing with one finance committee extension for one month. George Ryan, would you please present that? Okay. Yes, uh, at GOL's meeting um, on May 20, um, we voted unanimously to recommend to the town council that it extend Mary Lou Tileman's term as a non-voting resident member of the Finance Committee by one month to August 1st, 2020. Is there um, a second? Um, second up. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? Kathy. I have a, a am I on? Yes. Yes. Um, I just have a question. Um, in the memo, uh, George, I saw that you said you have a, a sufficient pool of applicants. So does the decision to go for just a one month extension mean we have more than one person interested in this, the available slot, and how many are interested? George? I would want to keep completely separate. I mean, I'm willing to speak later about the, the pool and, and the situation, but this is strictly a decision that was made utterly apart from the fact that we're going to have to fill this position. But um, so, this, okay. that was, I'm sorry. This decision the reason I'm is asking made. is if we only had one person, we could have just gone to a year appointment, correct? You know, if, I, I just, I had, I had been expecting we would get a recommendation for an appointment for a full year, but it sounds like, I, I'm fine with the one month, but it sounds like the reason you didn't do that is, uh, I don't know. No, no it, Two it, are totally it, separate. Totally separate. Um, because of the the one month budget extension, it didn't seem to make sense to the committee that we could potent put a potentially new uh, member of the uh, non voting resident member in that position. So that was the only reason. So um, okay. Um, and, okay. thank you. Yeah. There there will be a on another selection process, but that is a separate issue with GOL. Okay, any further questions? Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, we begin with DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. Yes. Reesmers, yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Paul Milne. Shalini. Shalini. Sorry about that. Yes. Brewer. <laughs> yes. It's a 12. Zero, zero, one absent. Uh, we now move on to item nine, 
which is committee reports, uh, community resources, Mandy Jo. I want to say thank you to my entire committee between, um, I think it's tomorrow and two weeks from two weeks and 15 days from tomorrow, uh, they will meet five times. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow, partially joint with the finance committee to talk about CPA. We will be talking about some other things, including noise by law at that time. On Wednesday, we will meet with the planning board at 745 to um, talk about zoning by law process, um, not any of the hearings. The next Wednesday, June 10th, is the hearing on temporary zoning by law, Article 14, starting at 635. On June 17th at 6:35 will be the hearing on the zoning bylaw 11.25 that we just referred today on site plan review voting requirements quantums. Um, and in the middle of that, we will also have another meeting on June 16th. So I thank the committee for all of the meetings that they will be going to. We will have a lot of reports coming up on all of that stuff. Um, we're working on noise bylaw, a little bit on wild animal act. We're, we're moving forward on stuff. Um, and the report next, next council meeting will have a, a more full report on what we've been doing. It may take up the whole town packet. <laughs> uh, Andy, finance committee. Yeah, just real briefly because I've already spoken to, to all of this anyway. Um, we are meeting tomorrow, as Mandy indicated, in a joint meeting to um, receive the presentation from the Community Preservation Act Committee. Um, I expect that we will uh, be taking up all of the issues that need to be decided um, in the regular course of budget process that um, proposals that have to do with funding uh, by borrowing can be dealt with at a later date. Uh, and uh, that doesn't need to be determined right now. So we may take those up as separate. Um, and then uh, we have the joint hearings that I've already reported on next week. And I will um, submit a report as soon as we've agreed to the proposed process um, for the entire budget cycle and uh, make sure that you get that promptly, probably at the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. George, GOL? Um, yeah, um, relevant to Kathy's comment earlier, the committee did vote unanimously at its last meeting to declare the pool for non-resident members uh, for the Finance Committee to be sufficient. Um, so it is definitely more than one. And um, we are now soliciting statements, uh, statements of interest, SOIs, and uh, waiting to get those back. And then we'll proceed on. But the process is in the works and uh, we're soliciting SOIs. Okay. Kathy, Joint Capital Planning Committee. Um, so I wanna start the way Mandy started with a, a thank you to all the members of JCPC and that includes three counselors. So in addition to all the meetings Mandy's going to um, and Andy's going to, they serve on that committee. We filed uh, the report and it's with our recommendations to the town manager today. It was today was the deadline. And some of you may or may not remember that the guidelines were changed only a little over 10 days ago. So we met twice since that to consider an entire different piece. So I'm not going to talk about those recommendations because Paul will be talking about them with the capital plan. But two issues I just wanted to bring to people's attention, and I did a brief report that you can read about this later, is we did come together and focus on the coming fiscal year. And given the uncertainty on where we'll be as we get into the coming fiscal year, the multi-year, the five-year capital plan becomes even more uncertain. So we're expecting JCPC will be asked to meet and the town staff has agreed in the fall. So this wouldn't be typical, but coming back to the multi-year plan. So expect to see that discussion. The second issue is the, um, we have in the charter, something called a capital inventory that the charter calls for, that we have an inventory of all significant assets, their useful life. And it has one additional sentence in it. And 
the guidelines and specs on what should be in the inventory shall be developed by the town council. And we haven't gotten that thorough inventory, I think in part because we haven't developed specs. So I'd like to bring it back to the council to say, should we refer the development of that either to the finance committee, to another committee or to an ad hoc committee on what do we mean by a full capital inventory? Cause it's supposed to be done at least annually. So I think the buck is on our shoulders right now to get this moving. And I would say, given the situation we're going to be in at least for the next year, knowing what we already own and its useful life and will help guide decisions on what other things we need to invest in. So the inventory is gonna be even more important than it would be just as a, a, a document to file, but a really, you know, how many buildings do we have? Are there buildings that are surplus? You know, so I think we need to take action, council members to figure out where to put the development of the standards and the specs for that. And that's just, I, the, the report gives you the citation to the charter, but it's just a uh, ask that we move that into, move it somewhere that we can come back with a recommendation, hopefully this year, not waiting a long time so we could develop an inventory. That's it. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Kathy. Let's discuss that and come up with some kind of motion, okay? Um, Outreach Communication and Appointments Ad Hoc Committee, Evan. Uh, open meets again on Monday, but has not met since the last council meeting, so has no report. Okay, and are you still accepting applicate applicants for ZBA? We are, we are always accepting planning, planning board, planning all bodies, but we are especially accepting applicants for the planning board right now. Thank you. Okay, and Town Services and Outreach, Darcy. Yeah, um, like uh, we said earlier, we met this morning. Um, we, and you have a report about that meeting, but it didn't come in until very shortly before this meeting. Um, we, we acted on uh, a list of um, reappointments to 11 different uh, town boards and committees that were set to expire at the end of June which we, we will act on at our next committee, our next uh, council meeting. Uh, we looked at the temporary zoning moratorium public way policy request, um, which we already acted on. Uh, and we started looking at a surveillance technology bylaw, Mandy Jo and um, Pat, our co-sponsors of a surveillance technology bylaw. So we got a brief introduction to that today. Mandy Jo answered some questions. Um, and we'll be looking at that uh, later on uh, after we talk more about our review process, which we are going to do at our next meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have already approved all the minutes uh, for the consent agenda, and so we're moving on to the town manager's report. And Paul, we only have one item after this, so why don't you take advantage? Okay, well, you have my written report. The only things that I would want to point out to you are um, the farmer's market went off um, pretty well over the weekend. It was very popular. A lot of people showed up. There were things that we learned in the process, things that'll change for next week. Um, the, the building commissioner was there pretty much most of the morning as was the assistant town manager and the, um, the health inspector. And then our health director also swung, was there. And I do wanna note that our um, uh, council president was first in line and uh, <laughs> made the first purchases of the day. So um, it was great because it was a, a glorious day and it, it turned out well. Um, the um, We are beginning our work on reopening the building the building to our staff. That's, that's a slow process, but we're, we're doing it step by step. So that's moving forward. Um, doing a cup of joe on Friday with uh, Sean Mangano and Sonia Aldridge as the guests. Uh, and then on Thursday, we're doing our call-in show, but instead of having Julie Fetterman there, we're going to have a takeover by the CP community participation officers. So they will all be part of it, um, answering questions for anybody. So it sounds that's gonna be a fun time too. 
Um, the last thing that I want to mention was that we are working on uh, voting locations. I mentioned that last time. So we have a team set up that includes the um, our uh, facilities person, the pub public works superintendent, the fire chief, and the town clerk being led by the town clerk. So those are the highlights I want to mention. And we have a question, George. Yeah, Paul, I just want to touch briefly on the, the reopening, uh, yeah. the work of the reopening committee. And I'm particularly uh, wondering about people around June 15 when most of the staff is perhaps many of the staff will be coming back to town hall. If you have individuals uh, on staff who have uh, people at home who are have pre-existing conditions or have some kind of vulnerability, is that something that, that will be taken into consideration? Um, and if they have these concerns, how could they how could they raise them? Um, that's the kind of question that I'm 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 wondering about. Sure. So and we do have people like that, and it's a it's a case by case situation. We talk with them. There are certain um, uh, options that are available to people under the um, uh, FFCRA. I forget exactly what that stands for. Uh, that gives people additional um, protections. Um, but it depends on the job. If uh, if the job can be done remotely, we we, we can accommodate that. Uh, we, but it it depends on the um, again on the department's needs and what and what we have available. We can't bring everybody back at the same time. I mean, I, I have the privilege of having an office. There's nothing that prevents me from being here on a daily basis. But there are people who live who are working in uh, uh, open space, and so we have to worry about how many people are in the shared space. So one of the things we're doing is looking at additional spaces in the building that have been used for meeting space that we can distance people and people would have pe give people their own space so that they feel a little more comfortable. So, but it's something, you know, we talk about with our health director, with our HR director and think it through in a, on a case by case basis. Are there other questions or comments on the town manager's report? Yes, Mandy Joe. Um, to follow up on George's question, we've, we've gotten a lot of, you know, we've seen, I've seen a lot of other towns in the area starting to open up their libraries for curbside pickup. Um, maybe some beaches are opening um, to, to reference Puffer's, Puffer's Pond, and we've gotten a lot of questions about can people swim in Puffer's Pond. Can you give us an idea of a timeline maybe when our library um, you know, I know you're not the library director, um, but, um, you know, when that might open up for potential, I know the employees aren't in there yet, but maybe when we might see a curbside pickup, um, what the thinking is on that. Um, and then things like Puffer's Pond, um, playgrounds, um, play structures, um, since I think those were included in phase two, we don't know when phase two will begin, um, but we know the announcement's coming in a week. So for the library, the, the director does have a plan for uh, bringing, uh, for opening curbside, but isn't isn't ready to staff it yet at this point because they it does require a fair amount of staffing to accept material coming back. Um, I think that's the first phase is to accept material that people want to return. Um, and it takes a lot of space inside the library as they manage the, because they have to bring books in, they have to um, have them be in a space for a couple of days before they touch them and things like that. Um, so I don't have a date for you, and I can I can ask her to see determine. It, we're sort of trying to walk together on this, and we've been targeting June fifteenth for our staff to again. It allows tw the governor's order allows twenty five percent occupancy, so that's not everybody coming up building open or anything like that. It's a very we might be at 25% today, in fact, just with the number of people who are here today. Um, so in terms of Puffer's Pond, we were shooting for June 1st. There, you know, The police chief and the assistant town manager have been working this um, with the superintendent of public works, thinking about how it's going to work. If we are going to manage it, it's going to take an enormous dedication of staff time. And we're not looking to hire a lot of people. We're trying to repurpose people who otherwise would have been doing something else to work up there. Um, but if we're going to manage it, say 10 to six, seven days a week, it, um, it just takes a lot of effort. And we would be regulating it by uh, parking and then uh, putting circles on the um, beach, you know, where people say, this is where you can safely social di distance. Um, 
we were initially looking at June 1st. Uh, we just had a conversation this afternoon with the town assistant town manager, um, concerned about me having said that date in the uh, town manager report, um, whether we can actually hit that date or not. Um, for uh, playground equipment, we've opened up the tennis courts. We have not opened up uh, basketball courts or playground equipment yet. Um, again, that's in the next phase for the governor. The governor just came out uh, this afternoon or tonight or the, his office with guidelines for summer camps that we're just starting to uh, study. Um, I haven't read them yet. Um, so we'll see what that, how that impacts our summer camp situation. Um, again, we focus, we funnel everything through our health director uh, because we wanna make sure that we're following the science, doing things the way we think it can be and trying to be aligned with the, the state government's rules. Okay. Uh, Kathy Shane. Um, I just, um, you, you may have heard this already, Paul, in our district one meeting um, as while well, we're talking about buffers, but also the bike trail came up. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple of people pointed out that the trail all the way around Puffers is a favorite walking trail um, in and in out. And it's often no more than a foot and a half wide. In some places, you know, it gets a little bit wider. And and that they said there's there's posting that your dog needs to be on a leash, although people don't always do it, but there's no posting that you should be wearing a mask. Um, and so the suggestion was do some kind of posting because there's a lot of people passing each other on that um, in a way that you cannot you cannot be six feet apart. It, well, you can if you're very agile because you can climb up the hill and get behind a tree, <laughs> or but you can't just move to the side of the trail. So it was thinking of that and and the bike trail a similar comment that it's not that wide but just a, a reminding people um, and. Most people, I think, are behaving quite courteously, um, in my experience, but uh, we had uh, several comments. I mean, Lynn was on the call with that, where people were talking about both biking and walking in narrow places, and they thought signage might help just to re remind people. So, you know, the bike trail is, is run by the state. It's not a town right. bike, bike trail. Um, but again, the uh, if bikers go by, when we, we have had this conversation many times with the health director and she thinks the viral load coming from a biker moving quickly is pretty minimal compared to other situations. I think you're right. I mean, I've, you know, we walk the um, trail around Puffers a lot too, and it is narrow. And while you people are very courteous and try to socially distance, you know, you have to have your mask with you because you are going to run into somebody. And, you know, let me think about that. And I'll raise that with, um, we're meeting up there on Wednesday, maybe make that a one-way path if we can somehow make it, it might make sense. Um, signage, we have some signage, but it does not address masks. You know, the policy of the town is that masks are required if you can't maintain social distance, uh, but you never know when that's gonna happen. Like if you're downtown or if you're on that path, probably you're gonna have a hard time meeting social distancing. Um, just to go back to one thing Mandy mentioned was about you, Puffer's Pond. If people want to swim in Puffer's Pond or do their aerobics exercise or something, that's permissible. Um, it's the camping out on the beach or sitting on the beach is what we're trying to uh, prohibit or inhibit for uh, manage, I guess, is what I want to say. I'm not sure people know that. So um, yeah, I think we might, it came up again in our district one meeting, but we might put a note out because this, this area uses that they, it's okay to walk into the water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I understand okay. that. Yeah. Lisa. Thank you. Uh, following up on the Puffer's Pond conversation and tying it into something George said earlier, I appreciated George leaving me not be the only one who kept bringing up over and over the idea of bringing back staff who may have underlying conditions that they're perfectly mm -hmm. adequate employees under any other circumstance, but now this is a fearful situation. And we don't want to just say, well, guess it's time for you to retire. Um, and at the same time, we're talking about Puffer's Pond where we've made very clear and even had a sign up that said beach is closed and there were people interviewed in the newspaper who said, gee, it's great there's nobody here because I can hang out on the beach now. And so I'm really concerned that if we aren't going to be clear about that, as we heard so much at District 1 and was very obvious in that Mass Live article, that if people think they're allowed to do something, we need to be clear on what they're not allowed to do because 
I don't want to see a ton of resources put into enforcement either. And when we're talking about staffing, we all know we've had incredibly minimal staffing at Puffer's Pond over the years. At best, we're lucky if we can hire somebody to do trash removal and keep people off the dam. And so I'm really concerned that there are people who show up, in fact, some of which are not Amherst residents, and say, I get to hang out on the beach because nobody else is here. How does that put us in a position if the next group of people is there and the first group of people didn't get asked to be moved along, but the people who showed up the next day did. So as we can get this clarified, I think that will be incredibly helpful. I realize, as I said to the people talking in District 1, we don't have the same rules that Northampton does because our Board of Health hasn't done that here. So we don't have those kind of signs, but that doesn't mean that we can't be clear. But people were literally photographed next to the sign that said beach is closed and said they were surprised no one was there because it was great. So thank you for any work that you guys can do to be creative so that we don't later get accused as we could quite reasonably be for discriminating against some folks and not others. Mm -hmm. Dorothy? Um, uh, Paul, could you give some details of possibilities of summer camp in Amherst? I don't know the details. I know that LSSC, I just saw an email while this meeting was going on from LSSC saying that they had a plan set up and now with the new state guidelines, uh, Barb said, looks like we have to go back to the drawing board. It messes with how we'd like laid out things we, we had anticipated. So the work that they had done, they now have to filter through what the state guidelines are. So I don't have guidance for you on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. I think it's a stay tuned for mm -hmm. you know, a bulletin. Any other questions of Paul at this time? All right, then I have a few comments. And that is, first of all, I would like to thank all the counselors and all the committee chairs. You've actually gotten us back to normal business. And uh, that has not been any small feat. Uh, several people have learned how to produce for other counselors. And I really appreciate that and how everybody has pitched in. Uh, I also want to thank all of the district councilors and the townwide councilors who attended all district meetings. Everybody in the last two or three weeks has had one district meeting. So district one, two, three, four, and five have all met and uh, with varying levels of, atten of attendance, but some excellent issues raised, which I've heard several councilors representing those uh, remarks here today. And I believe that the um, at-large counselors were able to attend many of those meetings and I wanna thank them for doing that. It was highly appreciated. Um, I will mention, but not for comment at this time that I've given you a draft, and I do mean draft timeline uh, for the town manager's evaluation. It's going to be most unusual to evaluate the town manager when a good third of the year or one fourth of the one third of the year was um, COVID. And, um, but I will be bringing that back. I have asked you for individual do not reply all comments on that. And with regard to that, one of the things that we are going to have to look at is the town counselors uh, calendar for council meetings particularly as it relates to late July and early August and whether or not we maybe need to schedule another meeting in order to get everything attended. And I am still working on the future agenda items. And in fact, because we now have a finance um, agenda uh, calendar for the various items will help me at least put together between now and I think the end of September, if not beyond. Um, are there any questions at this time? Are there any uh, future agenda items to be raised? Kathy raised one earlier. And are there any counselor comments? Then given that we have no executive session, we've dealt with all the topics that were 48 hours. Um, I call the meeting adjourned and it's only 945. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Lynn. Good night, everyone.